Well, welcome everybody to this fascinating session where we are going to talk about microbiomes, chemicals and health. We are going to put into the table very disruptive ideas about how to see human health, also soil health and environmental health, if we include into the equation the microbiomes where we evaluate the risk and the benefits. The microbiome field and the research area has evolved very quickly, is generating a lot of questions, but also generating a lot of hope. And we are here to discuss very important uh, questions that could impact our future. For example, whether we should include microbiomes in the way we evaluate risk in the food chain, or how we can exploit microbiomes, these biological stressors that are inhabiting the different ecosystems of the agrofood uh, production system to improve and transform this system in such a way that uh, we can uh, reach higher productivity of nutrition and health food and also uh, increase the resilience of our production system. Dreaming of these possibilities, we have organized this session has been so divided in two blocks. The first one will include three uh, speakers followed by a question and answer uh, part. Then we will have a coffee break of 20 minutes and then we will have the second block with uh, other two speakers, very brilliant speakers. And then uh, we will have a round table discussions where we encourage all of you to participate as well via the app. Your feedback is also very important to us uh, to reach uh, our final conclusions and take some action on the uh, course of the discussions and also considering uh, all your inputs. Well, my name is Yolanda Sanz. Uh, I'm Professor of Research of the Spanish National Research Council, uh, the main Pauline Research Institution in my place. I'm doing research in the microbiome field, mainly in relation to nutrition and health. And I also been engaged in EFSA uh, panels, first in the Nutri panel and later on in the FIDAC panel uh, for the last uh, 12 years. And in sake of uh, time, we are going to proceed directly introducing our moderator. She is uh, Daphne Miller. Uh, she is family physician, professor of family and community uh, medicine at the University of California at the Berkeley School of Public Health. She is uh, director of very interesting initiatives. One of the most relevant ones is uh, the Growing Health Collaborative Program, where she has been able to engage public uh, health, healthcare professionals in transforming the food system from the soil, from primary production. And she is also uh, very interested in, in understanding how the microbiomes of the individuals uh, influence social interactions. Daphne, thanks for coming here, for being with us. Thank you so much. Well, to start uh, with this session, uh, I would like to present our keynote speaker, Professor Jack Hilber. He got a PhD from uh, Unilever and Nottingham University, all postdoctoral positions at Queen's University in Canada. Later on, was a group leader for microbial ecology and director of the Microbiome Center at the University of Chicago, and currently is professor of pediatrics and also director of the Microbiome Core at the University of California in San Diego. And uh, from the multiple uh, merits of uh, Dr. Hilbert, I would like to highlight a couple of things. Uh, he has been co-founder of the Heart Microbiome Project and also coordinate, helped coordinate the American GUT uh, Project. I think that the best is to hear Hilbert. When you want, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> it's wonderful to be here. Um, uh, COVID struck me down uh, during my first trip abroad. <laughs> Well, the first trip to the East Coast, which for people on the West Coast of the United States is abroad. But um, this is my, uh, this is my uh, third or fourth lecture uh, now remote, thanks to COVID. So I, I apologize for not being there. But um, hopefully, uh, technology will enable us to be closer. So um, 
my my research is focused primarily on two functional aspects of microbial ecology. First is environmental health, and then we have human health. So it makes sense that I'm actually a professor of pediatrics and of oceanography. Um, these are it's a joint appointment that allows me to do a lot of different types of microbiome-based research. Um, I'm also associated with the uh, Center for Microbiome Innovation, and and I'm director of the Center of, um, of Mi Microbiome Metagenomics and Metatranscriptomic Studies, um, both at UCSD, and also editor-in-chief of M Systems, which is a microbial systems biology journal for the American Society for Microbiology. Great place to publish if you're looking for a venue. So um, I have some disclosures. Um, uh, various of relevance to this study are um, our programs in, called Holobiome, um, a, a Grossentia, uh, which is a probiotic company for agriculture, Valent Biosciences, which is another um, company for agriculture. Okay, so what is the microbiome? Well, the microbiome is a collection of microorganisms in an environment, right? It could be any environment. It could be the ocean. It could be um, a kilogram of sediment. It could be a gram of soil. It could be a plant leaf. It could be the human intestine, it could be your oral cavity, it could be the desk or seat uh, that you're sitting on right now. Uh, the, your, your chair has a microbiome. In fact, if I swabbed your chair right now, I could identify it was you sitting on that chair because of the bacteria that have passed through your clothing onto the chair and have been deposited there. And some of them are now living on the chair. So that microbial community contains bacteria, viruses, archaea, which is similar to bacteria, eukaryotes like protozoa and fungi um, and various other tiny little things which are associated and living in an ecological environment um, in that particular location, that niche. So um, when, we, when we think about the microbiome or that's relevant to this talk, um, we're going to be talking about the microbiome of soils and plants and the microbiome of our human body um, and the microbiome of our buildings all of which play a role in mediating the exposures uh, that human beings get to an environment and therefore are impactful for understanding the food chain um, and the impact of microbiome on food chain exposures. So um, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, we, we co-founded the Earth Microbiome Project um, uh, back in oh, 2010. Um, this is an ongoing uh, study uh, over the last 12 years, which is aimed to create standard protocols to analyze the microbiome and to catalog microbial diversity on our planet, including in our bodies, actually including in the orbital reach of Earth. So we include International Space Station and other spacecraft. Um, but the vast majority of our work has been focused on the natural world because that's, there's more of it. So um, uh, we found in this study, um, uh, or um, uh, demonstrated in this study to uh, 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 confirm pre prior studies that soils and sediments and plant roots were the most diverse microbial ecosystems on planet Earth. So on the y-axis here, you have number of species, essentially. And on the x-axis, you have things like animal corpus being very low in diversity. And then, you know, animal distal gut and plant rhizosphere, the, uh, the root microbial community being very, very uh, diverse. And then things like sediment soils, um, um, non-saline and saline sediments being incredibly diverse compared to other environments. So we know that soils are very diverse systems. We also know that the soil microbiome is, is what um, populates plants. So it, when we're looking at crops, so for example, in this study where we picked one of my favorite crops, Vitis vinifera, uh, the Merlot um, uh, grapevine to be specific as a varietal, um, we determined that the bacteria and fungi that were associated with grapes and leaves and flowers and bark and bulk soil, um, uh, sorry, uh, and bark, all came from the bulk soil. So in this particular graph, which you can see here on the right, um, it looks like a, a chaotic splatter of dots and lines. But what you're actually seeing here is um, all of these lines up here, these dots and lines up here are, are microbes that are associated with either the um, soil, the root, or the root zone, um, so in, in deep blue here and, and red. And these are all microbes which are found in the grapes, uh, leaves, and flowers um, of the actual plant structure. So um, all of the organisms that we identified up here came from here, apart from about 1%. 
one uh, percent of the microbes that we found on uh, leaves and grapes and flowers came from we think insects or wind borne deposits or rain borne deposits um, but the vast majority of them came through the plant as it was growing up through the phloem and xylem into the into the plant structure we know that the microbiome can play a fundamental role in productivity. Um, I know I'm, I'm covering a lot of this very quickly. I apologize, but um, uh, my other colleagues are going to give a overview, a much deeper overview of some of these concepts. But in this one study, uh, we looked at low input, small tropical, smallholder tropical farms, which support about 900 million of the world's poorest people. And we determined that um, using particular crop yields, sorry, using particular uh, rotations, legume rotations, and the optimized microbial diversity and optimized microbial functional diversity in the soil, we were able to demonstrate improved crop yields um, and improved microbial functional capacity. And this was important because what, what we showed is that adding um, organic matter into the soil was one of the key factors that could drive improvements in fungal and bacterial um, functional capacity, which appeared to be directly associated with improved crop productivity. And uh, working with companies like Valent Biosciences, uh, we've been able to see that the addition of certain types of fungi into the soil um, in cropping systems like mycorrhizal fungi can have a particular uh, impact upon crop yields. So, for example, here um, we showed that uh, uh, the vast majority of plots where we um, applied this mycorrhizal fungal application product saw a significant increase in yield in green compared to a, a, de a small decrease in yield in red um, associated with peanut cropping. And so this demonstrates that um, the addition of fungi, or in this case a microbiome, into the soil environment, into the cropping environment, can play a significant role in crop productivity. We also know um, that the um, mycorrhizal application product can actually improve um, stress responses in certain crops. So, for example, here, working with a corn system, a corn crop, uh, we show that mycorrhizal fungi can protect yield during drought conditions. Um, this has been demonstrated for certain bacteria as well. The addition of a bacteria or a fungus can, uh, in certain circumstances, improve how the cropping system responds to um, uh, a stressor, in this case, drought or heat. Um, so in, in this case, just having that mycorrhizal fungal application product significantly improves cropping. We also demonstrate um, in other studies that this, the, adding mycorrhizal fungi and certain bacterial species into these cropping systems significantly improves carbon drawdown and therefore um, is, uh, improves organic matter input into the soil, creating a richer, more resilient soil, um, which can significantly improve cropping systems and productivity, um, even under climate change based scenarios. Um, we also demonstrated in other studies that things like livestock, um, this isn't our study, but livestock feedstock um, uh, can influence the microbiome diversity of animal health um, uh, with a potential animal health implication, sorry. So in this case, uh, adding high concentrate fed animals have a significant increase in gamma proteobacteria. Gamma proteobacteria include organisms, like bacteria that are um, highly pro-inflammatory. They can contain compounds like lipopolysaccharides, um, like hydrogen sulfide production, like flagellin. These are compounds which are recognized by the animal's immune system and by our own immune systems um, and will trigger an inflammatory response um, as it's uh, identified as a pathogen marker. Um, and in this case, um, we see over here uh, a PCOA plot. Each one of these circles or squares is a microbial sample, um, a data point. Um, and uh, over here in blue, we have uh, animals that have been fed forage. And over here on right, we have animals that have been fed uh, concentrate. Um, and we can see that the microbiomes are very different in those animal systems. So um, having the wrong kind of food stock going into our animal population can play a negative role in animal health, which could potentially impact our food supply. We also know that um, what we feed our animals um, can be contaminated in ways that can significantly impact animal health. So, for example, looking at chicken feed that has fusarium endotoxin, 
uh, so fusarium being a, a fungal uh, contaminant of uh, chicken feed, uh, the endotoxin associated with uh, the uh, contaminated chicken feed can significantly alter um, animal health by potentially um, altering the microbiome and cause death damage. However, just to be funny, um, uh, we don't know if this is the chicken or the egg <laughs> um, because uh, we don't know if it was the fusarium endotoxin that altered the microbiome, which caused this pro-inflammatory milieu in the animal, or whether it's the, um, it's the uh, endotoxin changing the animal's immune system, which promotes the growth of a, uh, a pro-inflammatory microbiome. Um, there appears to be a cyclical loop there, which I'll talk about a bit. But some of our own work um, here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography with a very talented uh, graduate student, Cara Wigan, has demonstrated that microplastics coming into the food chain in ocean um, aquaculture systems can have a significant impact upon um, the pr uh, propensity of um, aquaculture products such as shellfish to uh, contain pathogens. So we uh, demonstrate that um, things like Vibrio parahemolyticus, a known foodborne pathogen, grow more prolifically at higher temperatures. Um, they tend to bind and grow as biofilms on the outside of microplastics in the ocean. And we know that the exposure to microplastics um, for these oysters um, can, um, can actually cause a microbial dysbiosis in the oyster. And I'll talk about what dysbiosis is in a minute. Um, and can impact immune system alterations um, and lead to a higher burden of uh, foodborne pathogens in, uh, in shellfish and in, in seafood, which can lead to significant elevated levels of uh, food poisoning in human populations consuming raw shellfish. Um, we've also, one of my postdocs just joined a company. I have no uh, financial relationship with this company, um, uh, but uh, called Native Microbials where they're actually examining the introduction of probiotic formulations to improve milk yields in, um, in uh, dairy cows. So, for example, in this study, they took 30 Holsteins, the, um, the uh, cow breed, um, in control and treatment groups, randomly assigned to either a probiotic formulation or a control, and then kept the animals in the same pen equipped with multiple feed managers and restricted by group. And they demonstrate Pardon me. They demonstrate a significant increase in um, in the um, uh, milk yield um, over time um, in animals receiving a probiotic formulation. So it's possible to stimulate animal health and improve um, uh, uh, food uh, um, productivity in these animals using uh, probiotic formulations. So summary of this uh, first agricultural side, microbiome crop derives from the soil, microbiome of the crop. So whatever gets into the crop comes from the soil. So soil health is very important. Chemical fertilizers can alter that soil microbiome, which can be rescued by adding organic matter. Mycorrhizal fungi and other bacterial probiotics can improve soil quality, crop yields, and stress resilience in crops. So we don't necessarily need to use those chemical fertilizers and potentially even pesticides. Animal feed contaminants can influence animal health by changing the microbiome. Uh, microplastics in the ocean can increase the risk of food poisoning from raw shellfish, and probiotics can help to improve cow milk yield without the need for additives. It may seem like I'm cherry picking um, studies here. I am for sure. I'm cherry picking ones that I'm involved with, um, but it's, uh, it gives you a broader overview of the kinds of research and the way in the what microbiome can play a role in this particular um, area. Okay, so do our own health. Our own health is very important to us. Um, I like to think of the immune system in our bodies as a gardener. Um, so here on the left, I have uh, an immune marker, um, a, a antibody, um, and in the on the right, I have our gut microbiome, and in the middle, um, I have a picture of a gardener, um, because the immune system is basically maintaining the microbial garden in our body. It's maintaining the uh, the productivity of those bacteria. Um, and fungi and viruses and archaea, which it believes are beneficial to human health or benign. Um, and it's um, trying to reduce the abundance of bugs that can cause problems, right? So um, in, in this context, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an analogy which works, right? If there's a disturbance in the immune system, it can disturb the microbiome. But interestingly, if there's a disturbance in the microbiome, it can disturb the immune system. So for example, here um, in this wonderful infographic from Mariana Bindloss, I've taken a cross-section of a, a, a gut, 
and I have the gut lumen um, at the top and then the uh, gut lining in, in here with these uh, colonocytes or, um, or enterocytes, the cells that line the gut, and then the rest of the body cavity down here. On the left, I have what's termed homeostasis, where um, I have a low oxygen potential inside the intestine, which promotes the growth of obligate anaerobic bacteria, these little blue guys, which produce uh, by the fermentation of fiber that we consume. So all that dietary fiber you consume isn't really for you, it's for your bacteria. The bacteria consume that dietary fiber, produce things like short chain fatty acids, such as butyrate, which are actually a primary fuel source for colonocytes and enterocytes, which they uh, use as energy via beta oxidation to consume oxygen and grow and mature. So you get a very mature, very strong cell lining of your gut, which stops things from trying to get from the gut into the body um, and also uh, consumes oxygen and stops oxygen from getting into the body cavity. But let's say we disturb that system by pumping it full of antibiotics or maybe a high fat, high sugar diet or maybe a contaminant such as um, PCB or lead. Um, which comes into the body and it can disturb the microbiome by killing off certain species. So let's say it kills off those obligate anaerobes. So now I have a situation where facultative anaerobic bacteria, such as our gamma proteobacteria, which produce all that lipopolysaccharide, the LPS, and, and the pro-inflammatory compounds like the gelin, they start to grow out of control. These guys don't really produce a lot of short-chain fatty acid. So what they tend to do is lead to the starvation of these colonocytes, these enterocytes that line the gut. They uh, are no longer able to get their primary fuel source, so they actually enter into an anaerobic glycolysis state where they don't consume oxygen. Um, and that oxygen now leaks across this now leaky cavity lining into the body, into the, into the gut lumen, um, increasing oxygen potential and retarding the redevelopment of these um, oxygen-hating obligate anaerobes. So now we've got a situation that's a negative feedback loop, right? The, the good guys can't come back. The gap, bad guys are proliferating. They're producing lots of things which now get across this leaky gut membrane and cause inflammation. That is, this one um, infographic is a really, really solid indication of what we mean when we say something goes wrong in the microbiome, it can cause problems, right? There is a bidirectional relationship, a communication between the microbiome and the body. And so this disturbance is at the heart of pretty much everything that we uh, we deal with in when we talk about microbial dysbiosis. So what happens in dysbiosis? Well, we've shown um, in uh, pioneering work from the likes of um, of Eran Elenav and the Suez et al. paper in 2014, that the consumption of things like uh, commonly used non-calorific artificial sweeteners can cause um, the development of glucose intolerance through the induction of compositional and functional changes in the microbiome, right? Dysbiosis. So we think that these non-calorific artificial sweeteners cause a change in that obligate to, um, to facultative anaerobic bacterial population in the gut, promoting bacteria to grow, which don't produce the right kind of compounds, which can actually significantly alter your blood glucose levels. Um, when we give the um, animals here antibiotics in A and B, so red and black, we see a significant reduction in this blood glucose spike after a glucose treatment um, because we've removed the bacteria which cause that problem and uh, so the animal is now responding positively. So we, we believe that these artificial sweeteners are disturbing the microbiome, causing a change in your insulin and incretin production which alters your blood glucose level. We know that food additives and artificial sweeteners can have a big impact upon the gut bacteria themselves, actually targeting those organisms. In this uh, particular interesting study in the European Journal of Nutrition that came out a couple of years ago, they used a fermented fecal microbiota in an artificial gut system with a huge range of additives. I won't go into all of them, but I suggest you read this paper if you're interested. So here you take each part of the gas gastrointestinal tract and the bacteria that live therein, because each part has its own unique microbiome. The small bowel is quite different from the colon, which is quite different from what lives in the stomach, which is quite different from what lives in the esophagus, right? Um, in the duodenum, it's different again. So the, this, this, you can divide it up and grow in a continuous culture mechanism the bacteria that live in those particular niches and then expose them to these pollutants. And here we see, for example, butyrate decreasing and some of those gamma proteobacteria, those LPS and, and um, flagellum producing organisms like Escherichia coli, Shigella, Klebsiella pneumophilia, um, those increase 
with things like cinnamaldehyde. So it, it, consumption of, um, of common uh, food additives can significantly alter the microbiome and promote what we would class as a dysbiotic pro-inflammatory community. We also know with the same kind of system, I've stolen the picture, but it's exactly the same kind of system, that things like PAHs, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, can also have an impact. So, for example, here we know that the microbiota in the colon, using this kind of system, so the colon would be kind of down here, um, uh, can actually catalyze those PAHs into estrogen, altering the endocrine balance in the body, uh, because that estrogen can now be absorbed across the gastrointestinal membrane and uh, cause to uh, hormonal disruption in the body. Um, and it's unclear if this actually alters the hormone responses in the body, because this has really only been done in vitro and observed in a few uh, small-scale studies, but uh, more work definitely needs to be done there. We know that things like PCB exposure, polychlorinated biphenyls, can cause intestinal pathophysiology, which could either be the cause or the effect of changes in the microbiome, which appear to be um, leading to a significant increase in inflammatory response in mice. In a limited human cohort study, uh, also published uh, three years ago, uh, with about 43 people, they demonstrated that PCB exposure can retard or alter gut microbiome development in children. But there's no, still no robust data on whether this disruption, this dysbiosis caused by PCBs actually significantly alters human health. And this is a running theme, which I'll talk about in a minute. Heavy, heavy metal exposure like cadmium, for example, has been shown to alter the composition of human and mouse gut uh, microbiome and physiological responses. And those gut microbiome changes are associated with, again, our, our old friends, lipopolysaccharide, LPS, uh, which we believe uh, could be causing hepatic inflammation um, and energy metabolism dysregulation in the mouse model, right? Um, and there's plenty of um, uh, observational data to associate exposure to heavy metals with um, human health outcomes and also disruption of the microbiome, but I don't include those. Pesticides have also been demonstrated to have a significant effect. So, for example, chloropyphros has been associated with reduced gut barrier integrity. Uh, and increases that lovely old friend LPS, lipopolysaccharide in the serum, and you get an increased inflammatory cytokine signature, so reducing interleukin-10 and increasing interleukin-6 and interleukin-17, which are associated with increased inflammation. And disturbances in the microbiome were found, but they were very variable across people, suggesting that um, either the pesticide is impacting the human immune system, which is changing the microbiome, more likely, or there is small shifts in pesticide exposure in the microbiome, which could cause a feedback loop on the body. We also know that the buildings we live in contain microbial exposures, which could be impactful, and therefore the type of environment our house is in could play a role in shaping the kind of exposures that we get. So, for example, um, every single one of you sitting in the room right now, and I can see the backs of your heads, I'm right behind you. Um, uh, they, uh, those, uh, you're, you're all shedding around 30 million bacteria um, a hour just sitting there. So every single one of you is shedding 30 million bacteria into your immediate vicinity every hour. But this building is in a location and the types of plants and agriculture and types of contaminants and exposure in the environment can change which bacteria can survive and thrive. And importantly, which fungi as well, which molds and, and other forms of microbial life can survive and thrive in the building. And so what we've been doing is exploring how this shift, this change in the microbes which can survive in a building based upon what surface materials and what environment the building's in and what impact they could have upon human health. And so to, you know, um, to be very brief about this, uh, we know that things like dampness can influence uh, mold growth and bacterial growth, which can release metabolites um, as uh, volatile organic compounds. And there is a lot of evidence to support that these can significantly impact things like nosopharyngeal inflammation, wheeze and cough. They can impact like things like bronchitis, allergic rhinitis and eczema. We also have some evidence to suggest it can alter or impact the severity of things like um, rhinoviruses, so the common cold. And we have some preliminary data which we haven't published yet suggesting it can impact COVID um, uh, infections, which is funny because I just caught COVID. Um, and also there's clinical evidence to suggest uh, we have, uh, it can impact, impact our hypersensitivity and pneumatitis. And so all of these, um, uh, these 
uh, volatile organic compounds, the aldehydes, alcohols, amines, geosamine, being released into the environment can play a role in human health. How do we examine this? Well, we use things like microbiome-wide association studies to examine how the microbiome associates with human health. So in our American Gut Project, we looked at um, about 30,000 people, and we examined how these little microbial chemical engineers, um, how their chemical products associate with human health outcomes. So for example, the microbes can produce things like short-chain fatty acids that I talked about before, like acetate, also, things like indoles, which are incredibly important in human health, and we're now using those indoles as a, um, as a treatment strategy for certain diseases. Um, and things like uh, tryptophan, like amino acids, for example. They can also break down our drugs, so uh, modifying like acetaminophen, common painkiller, um, uh, to acetaminophen sulfate, which can cause liver toxicity. So you've got the wrong bacteria in your gut, acetaminophen could be damaging if consumed over a long period of time. And they can also break down the chemicals we release, like primary bile acids, um, break them down to secondary bile acids, which can leave us, um, can change our susceptibility, reducing our susceptibility to things like infectious disease. Um, we know that the microbiome can predict these diseases. So, for example, the microbiome can very easily predict whether you're lactose intolerant or whether you're obese. Um, much more so than the human genome here in blue. So, human genome is less predictive of these features than the microbiome. We know that microbiome um, alterations, this dysbiosis that we were talking about earlier, can lead to things like high, to lead things like obesity. So, for example, here, a high-fat diet causes aberrant microbial signatures in the gut, which produces some of those chemicals we we're talking about: lipopolysaccharide, hydrogen sulfide, which appear to disrupt circadian rhythm genes that um, control how your organs sense time inside the body, which actually leads to metabolic dysfunction and creates obesity. And so we can show that by knocking out the genes for metabolic dis uh, for uh, time sensing in the body or changing the microbiome, and it can disrupt that signature. We know the microbiome disruption, dysbiosis, can lead to mental health complications. So we already know that the microbiome is linked to brain development, mood and behavior, um, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We know that there's a lot of comorbidity between central nervous system disorders, CNS, and gastrointestinal disorders, i.e. when you are depressed, you quite often, um, or that comes associated with things like uh, 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 constipation or diarrhea. And we know that antibiotics, uh, uh, chemicals which kill bacteria, are linked to behavioral phenotypes like depression and anxiety. Interestingly, antifungals and antivirals aren't, right? So there's no association there. We also know that we can take the microbiome of a clinically depressed person and transplant it into the gut of a mouse, and the mouse will show a very different behavioral phenotype to uh, mice that have received the microbiome from a non-depressed person. So this, this ability to transfer a behavioral phenotype with a microbiome is key. And we've also demonstrated that people who have major depressive disorder and have um, signals in their brain of that disorder are um, associated with dysbiosis, particularly a significant reduction in the abundance of bacteroides, uh, which produces gamma aminobutyric acid in the gut, also known as GABA. GABA is a neurotransmitter. Your gut produces the vast majority of, of GABA and serotonin in the whole body. And these neurotransmitter disturbances, we believe, can propagate through the system and cause significant changes in brain chemistry and therefore depression and anxiety. So chemical exposures could cause these problems. We know that cancer is associated with the microbiome. And I've got a couple of really boring visuals here. Um, one is from madet.info. I suggest you go and have a look at madet.info. It's a great website for demonstrating um, the strength of evidence for particular associations between particular bacteria and uh, particular um, effects of either treatment or uh, disease severity for cancer treatment. Um, and also uh, this website, cancermicrobiome.ucsd.ec.edu, sorry, cancermicrobiome.ucsd.edu, or uh, read the paper Poor et al. 2020, demonstrates very significant predictive capabilities for the microbiome and um, cancer type and stage. So uh, we know that disturbances in the microbiome can be linked to uh, cancer onset, uh, cancer susceptibility, and also treatment efficacy. So um, things like chemotherapy and radiotherapy, we've demonstrated can be um, uh, altered in their efficacy by changes in the microbiome. We also know that surgical complications, such as uh, post-surgical infections, um, can be associated with exposures prior to the surgery. 
So the kinds of things you're exposed to, like the environment you're exposed to, whether you have more plants, in flowering plants, especially in the immediate vicinity of your home, the likelihood you have pets, um, the types of chemicals you use to, um, to fertilize or as pesticides and herbicides in your garden, um, and the types of foods you're consuming have all been directly associated with shifts in the abundance of bacteria in the gut, which can degrade the gut lining um, during surgery. So these bacteria are called collagenolytic bacteria. They can produce collagenase, which is an enzyme that breaks down collagen. Um, and the treatment of um, our, our patient during surgery doesn't remove this bug. In fact, this bug stays and is very active. Um, and um, we uh, have demonstrated this directly associated with exposure. So in this particular story, for example, here we're going to remove a piece of gastrointestinal tract and chop it out because it's cancerous. And then we, um, by doing this, we expose that microbiome to oxygen. Um, remember oxygen? Most of the bugs, the good bugs, don't like oxygen. Then we pump the body full of antibiotics, and the antibiotics kill the rest of the good bacteria. Um, and then we stitch the gut back up, forming an anastomotic junction. Um, and this is your wound site. Um, the body now starts to suck phosphate out of the gut, which leaves, um, causes the bacteria which have survived to starve. They then change their phenotype to a biofilm-forming phenotype, start to produce that collagenase, which breaks down the collagen matrix of that wound site. And the gut now opens up, your gut content spit out into your body cavity, you get sepsis and uh, quite often uh, die, unfortunately. So this is a, this is a real trajectory, it's something we've demonstrated is directly associated with exposure. So in summary for the human stuff, when microbiome is disturbed, it can upset that delicate balance that, um, that relationship between the microbiome and the immune system leading to dysbiosis. Things like artificial sweeteners and other food additives can alter the composition of the microbiome, resulting in dysbiosis and real health consequences such as glucose intolerance. PAHs, PCBs, heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides have all been shown to disturb the microbiome, uh, but there are a few studies that conclusively link uh, that disturbance with direct health outcomes. The indoor microbiome can influence health, so what our in homes are exposed to and what chemicals we use in our homes can play a significant role in human health outcomes. The microbiome can influence allergic reactions, uh, obesity, mental health, cancer, just to name a few. Um, we found disturbances uh, for many, many different disorders. And lifestyle and exposure can affect the microbiome and influence treatment outcomes during surgery and other uh, clinical um, uh, treatment options. So microbiome research, uh, we've developed microbial diagnostics to predict disease and complications resulting from a disturbed microbiome. We know that microbiome derived small molecules can be used for the treatment of allergic disease, metabolic and neurological diseases. They can be also used to improve the rescue from damaging exposures. So we've actually recently demonstrated and had a paper accepted that hasn't quite come into press yet. Uh, that demonstrate that lactobacillus produce indole 3 acetic acid, I3AA can actually rescue fibrotic damage associated with cigarette smoke. So exposures in our environment that affect our body can be rescued by bacteria which produce particular chemicals. We, um, we have to redefine microbiome research, helping us to redefine that human environmental health nexus. So what's in the soil affects what's in our food, what's in our food affects what's in our body, what's in our body affects what's um, our health outcomes. So it's important to understand that. And we need to broaden those clinical trials to, uh, to test microbiome interventions in high-risk diseases and exposures that could be used as a risk management perspective for understanding the food chain and its impacts upon human health. And we need to create new technologies and informatics to support the globalization of diagnostic risk assessment and therapeutic potential um, to understand the real impact between exposure and microbiome and human health. So just to finish up, last slide. Um, it's very important that we understand how to improve Human studies, one of the running themes I mentioned was that there's still very limited evidence that when um, these exposures disturb our microbiome, it actually impacts our health. And even in our animal studies, uh, such as cows and chickens and pigs, when the microbiome is disturbed, there's still limited evidence to directly link that disturbance to the health outcomes of the animal, right? So advancing human and animal uh, crop microbiome research requires a number of different particular angles and I stole this from a recent paper by my two good friends uh, John Cryan and Sarkis Masmanian 
But um, in this study, uh, we, they, no, well, this uh, perspective piece, they state that we really need to define that normal and healthy gut microbiome. We need to really figure out what we mean by health promoting um, and not just, you know, it's not disease promoting. Uh, we need to understand the effect of lifestyle and exposures on that microbiome. That, that requires uh, very detailed human clinical studies. We need more accurate controls, right? So um, there's a lot of noise in human data. And so getting people in the same household, for example, that are exposed to different aspects of a, of a pollutant or a food um, additive is really important. We need to understand the contribution of that gene environment impact. So the human um, uh, genome also could play a role in our response to exposures. And it's very important to get that relationship correct. And then we need to, need to define that directionality between cause and effect. Because I've mentioned the chicken and the egg multiple times. It, we really need to delineate that and perform large scale translational longitudinal studies, right? Because just because you have a disturbance at one time point and nothing happens doesn't mean something's not going to happen a year, two years, 10 years down the line. So we really need long term studies to understand the real impact of these exposures. Thank you very much to my uh, supporters and to my wonderful lab. Thank you. Well, uh, I think that we don't have so much time for questions after Jack's talk. It was an absolutely terrific talk, but we're going to just take one quick question, and then uh, we're going to have you come back at the end of the panel because we uh, have uh, there's many questions coming on the screen here. Um, but hi, Jack. I don't know if you remember, but we had breakfast together about six years ago in a hotel in San Francisco. And I was actually writing a popular science paper at the time. And at the time, I asked you the question which the audience has asked several times over here, which is basically, are there any causal links that we can prove at this point and hang our hat on? Um, we have, I suppose, an audience uh, full of professionals who want to protect people. And uh, this sounds, the microbiome sounds like something absolutely worth protecting, whether it's in the soil or in the chickens or in ourselves. And I wrote this unbelievable list of things that you mentioned that hurt the microbiome, from fertilizers to cadmium to um, artificial sweeteners to uh, fat and food to aldehydes, which I think are probably in this couch. Um, and uh, is there anything you're willing to ha hang your hat on now, five years later, and propose that it is something that uh, we have enough evidence to start to create um, some kind of standards for either policy or regulation or public health protection? The short answer is no. The longer answer is way more complicated. Um, and. Um, not to belabor a point, but I, I will, I, the running theme in all of this is that disturbances associated with foodborne exposures or environmental exposures in both animals and humans tends to result in a microbiome that could be considered pro-inflammatory. And inflammation is at the basis of nearly all human and animal chronic diseases in our populations, right? So. Uh, when, when we think about most chronic diseases, we think about inflammation as either a trigger or an exacerbating agent. So I like to think of it more like a cycle, right? When we, when we think about causation and risk factors, we usually say this particular compound gets in the body, finds this receptor, causes this protein conformation change, which triggers this cascade and causes a problem, right? Um, what we're actually dealing with here is a multifactorial impact, which is why it's been so hard to define. If the, the, the chemical uh, that gets into the body, such as an artificial sweetener, could cause some kind of conformational change in the human and the human's response variable, but it's also causing a change in the microbiome, which causes an increase in an inflammatory state, which disturbs how the body responds uh, but by changing the, uh, the delicate balance between microbial metabolism and, say, incretin insulin secretion in the pancreas, it can shift that delicate relationship with blood glucose, which can cause uh, a series of secondary inflammatory cascades, and you get this negative feedback cycle, uh, which disturbs the entire system. 
So while uh, that direct causality is really difficult to prove, we have a few instances, you know, I would say uh, six months prior, well, at least two to three months, so at least six weeks prior to surgery, I would avoid being exposed to any, um, I would eat a very, very healthy diet. <laughs> I, would, I would also uh, try to avoid being exposed to any um, uh, negative uh, high levels of uh, fertilizers or pesticides, um, especially chemicals, in, in your environment. And I would, I would try and avoid air pollution. Um, and if you could, uh, that will significantly reduce your likelihood of having an um, a impact uh, of such as a post-surgical complication. But linking to very, very critically uh, policy-based risk factors, we just don't have the evidence, I would argue. There might Great. Be a few well, what we will do is come back to this, and we really, really appreciate that wonderful talk. And I'm going to uh, hand it back to Yolanda here. For Thanks, thank yes. you so much. Yeah, we yeah. have to move forward, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce now Benoit Chassé uh, from the National Institute of Health and Medical Research in Sarm in Paris, France. Uh, he is visiting microbiology uh, from the University of Clermont Ferrand. Uh, working on the virulence factors of E. coli strains that were involved in Crohn's disease. Later on, moved to Georgia State University to work on the microbiota, mucosal immunology as well. And uh, currently, uh, back in France, especially uh, in Paris, he has been appointed as assistant professor and is focusing on the uh, mechanisms by which specific food components could alter the microbiota and how we can restore these alterations. The floor is yours. Thank you for this, uh, for this uh, kind introduction. So what I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit today is relate uh, to the use of various food additives and how uh, they can drive a detrimental response in, in, in the gut. So it, it's very easy to do this talk after Jack's uh, presentation because he introduced a lot of concepts and, and a lot of things that I'm going to, to discuss uh, a little bit also with, with you right now. So what I'm, I, I just wanted to give a very, very brief introduction about the, the intestine microbiota, which is again the very complex community of microorganisms that's colonizing our gut. And what's really fascinating with this, with this microbiota is, is that it can be highly, highly beneficial, but also can be highly, highly detrimental. So it can be highly beneficial because it can protect against uh, pathogen and, and, and it's playing a very important role in maturating our immune system. So we are always very often talking about the detrimental role of the microbiota, but it's also very, very important for health. But on the other hand, and at the same time, it can also drive a very important detrimental impact for its host, such as the promotion of chronic intestinal inflammation and metabolic deregulation, obesity, diabetes, you just name it. So it's, to me, really, really fascinating that the same community living in the same uh, organs can play this type of dual role. And what we are trying to understand in the lab and what numerous laboratories are, are trying to understand is how we are going to, to, to go from one, one side, one beneficial effect to the detrimental effect uh, of, the, uh, of the intestinal microbiota. So what we are currently uh, highly focusing in, in the lab, and, and this is just a few examples I'm, I'm going to give you, uh, relate to, the, to uh, what we call microbiota encroachment and the ability of select microbiota to penetrate, you can see the normally sterile uh, mucus layer here, and, and what we are able to demonstrate is that it's actually very important to keep this area here completely sterile in order to have the de beneficial impact of the microbiota. And as soon as you will have colonization of this mucus layer, you are going to be, it's going to be associated with the detrimental impact of the intestinal microbiota. So Jack uh, gave us uh, really a very, very nice and elegant overview of numerous things that can uh, impact the, the microbiota. And what I am going to do is just to give you one example, but uh, go a little bit more in, into details about it. So again, food additives we know can, can play a very important role in uh, impacting the intestinal microbiota and, and altering its, its composition and its function. And yes, I don't know, my screen is off here. So and among food additives, there is a lot of them that, that can be used, but one I wanted to give you an example on is uh, our dietary emulsifiers. So dietary emulsifiers are uh, really present everywhere in, in, in the food that's uh, processed and ultra processed, and, and it's very important to improve texture and, and extend shelf life of the packaged product. Uh, so you can see that this is uh, really, really highly used by, by the food industry. And we did some study in the past focusing on two of them, uh, carboxymethylcellulose or uh, E466, as well as polysorbate 80, uh, which stand also as uh, E433. And again, they are uh, really, really ubiquitous in, in uh, processed and ultra-processed food. And, and we've started our study on two of them. 
but there is uh, a lot and there is numerous that are, that are approved to be used uh, in the, by, the, by the food industry. And what's pretty fascinating when we started this work uh, almost 10 years ago now is th there, was, there were only epidemiological evidence suggesting that there is definitively a connection between the use of those additives and, and the, the increased the rising increase in, in inflammatory diseases, obesity, uh, diabetes. There were some preclinical studies also suggesting that maybe they can have a detrimental impact. And um, I also find those epidemiological data quite fascinating. Is if you look at um, a Crohn's disease patient, uh, we know that one way of dampening the disease in Crohn's disease patient and one way to increase and, and prevent the, the relapse in Crohn's disease patient is to have some dietary uh, management. And you can see that most of the diets that are uh, currently being used in Crohn's disease patient management are avoiding dietary emulsifiers. So you see in brown, this is the, the food components that are not allowed. And you can see, and this is especially the case for CDED, uh, Crohn's disease exclu exclusion diet, which is working very well for a subtype, for a subgroup of Crohn's disease patients. You can see that, of course, this is removing a lot of uh, things from the food, but emulsifiers in one, is one of them. So this was, again, one couple of data suggesting that those food additives can likely play a role in impacting the microbiota in, in a detrimental way. So what we uh, started to do with uh, using a preclinical uh, preclinical model was uh, to look at microbiota localization because again I told you that uh, microbiota localization is something very very important to drive its beneficial effects, and you can clearly see here in in controlled uh, uh, untreated mice we can definitively find here this no man's land on top of the mucosa, and as soon as we started to treat the mice with either CMC or PAT, which are again two highly used uh, dietary emulsifiers, this is what we observed. You can see that now the mucus layer is completely colonized uh, with uh, bacteria from, from the gut, and when we measure the distance, you can see this approximately two-fold decrease in the distance that separate the microbiota from its host. And this is uh, something that's, that's pretty striking and highly reproducible in, in our hands. So not only the microbiota is getting closer to the epithelium, but it's also starting to express much more pro-inflammatory molecules. So here again, it, this was introduced in, in the previous talk, that uh, you can see we are, we are able to measure flagellin on the left and lipopolysaccharide on the right, which are uh, two molecules that are expressed by the microbiota and that can drive chronic intestinal inflammation. You can see in blue that if we left the mice untreated, the, 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 the level of those molecules, those pro-inflammatory molecules is pretty stable uh, throughout the time. However, as, uh, as soon as we start to treat the mice with either CMC or PAT, you can see that the microbiota is starting to express a crazy amount of those uh, pro-inflammatory molecules. So demonstrating that not only consuming emulsifiers is impacting microbiota composition, localization, but also its ability to express highly uh, potent pro-inflammatory molecules. So of course, uh, we investigated what was the consequences for, for the host, and, and just to give you one example, but again, this is just uh, one example among many other observations. When we took mice that are genetically susceptible to develop colitis, kind of to mimic uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in, in human, uh, this is what we observed, where you can see in, in, in blue that water-treated animals develop uh, some level of colitis with an incidence of approximately 40% at, at three months, while if we treat the mice with either CMC or PAT, we are doubling the incidence of the colitis, so, so, and we are reaching an incidence of close to 100%. And what's very interesting and, and not presented here, uh, for sake of, of time, is not only there is much more animals developing colitis, but also the colitis observed in those animals here, uh, treated with CMC or PAT, are much more severe compared to the colitis uh, observed in the controlled untreated uh, animals. So clearly demonstrating that consuming dietary emulsifier is sufficient to promote the, the, the incidence as well as the severity of the colitis. And what's pretty fascinating with this, uh, with this system, and this is uh, again something we are, something we are uh, still highly working on, is uh, again, if you take conventional mice with a microbiota, you can drive chronic intestinal inflammation by treating with emulsifiers. And if you split the system and use germ-free mice, so mice without any microbiota, those mice are actually completely protected against the detrimental impact of emulsifiers. So this is demonstrating that you need to have the microbiota to have the detrimental impact of those uh, food additives. And uh, on the other hand, if you take an in vitro microbiota, so a microbiota without any host component, you treat it with emulsifiers, you, you, we, can, we are actually able to reproduce what we observed in, in the mice before. And, and the beauty of this system is you can take those in vitro uh, treated microbiota, transplant them to germ-free mice, and by doing that, this is sufficient to uh, promote chronic intense inflammation. So in the middle part, this is an approach that we use to demonstrate that the microbiota is required to drive the detrimental impact of emulsifiers. 
on the right, this uh, experimental approach allows us to demonstrate that the macrobiota is sufficient to drive the detrimental impact of dietary emergency cells. So yeah, this is what I, I just wanted to um, highlight in this presentation, where the macrobiota is, is clearly the direct target, and it's both necessary and sufficient to drive chronic intestinal inflammation when uh, the animals were consuming dietary emergency cells. And what's uh, very interesting with this system is that uh, there is some resistant uh, macrobiota, that, uh, so basically not all the macrobiota are going to respond the same, whereas there is some resistant macrobiota that are going to be fully protected, and I'm not going to go into much detail about that, we can discuss during the question if you want. And uh, on the other hand, there is some susceptible macrobiota, and you definitely need to host some specific species that are going to specifically detect those food additives in a way that can drive chronic intestinal inflammation and metabolic deregulation. So of course, we, we were also highly interested in, in the human relevance of our study, and this is why we uh, started a, a collaboration uh, five years ago with Gary Wu and Jim Lewis from uh, UPenn, as well as Andrew Gevers from uh, Georgia State University, in which uh, what we did, so this was really a pilot experiment using a very limited number of participants on, over a very short period of time. But what we did was to have two groups of participants. One group was uh, following an additive-free uh, diet, so a diet that was not containing any single type of food additives. And uh, the, the second arm was uh, consuming exactly the same diet, plus a supplementation with only one dietary emulsifier. And for this study, uh, we started with uh, carboxymethyl cellulose. And what we observed, even on such short, short period of time, and even using such uh, re relatively limited number of participants, was uh, pretty uh, encouraging for the future. You can clearly see here that in blue you have the untreated participant and in orange you have the, the CMC treated participant and it perfectly fits with what we observed before. But not only the macrobiota composition is altered and it's shifting, but also you are increasing the inter-individual variability. And, and this is uh, a key, uh, a key um, uh, aspect, a key, uh, um, a key observation ob observed uh, many, many times under dysbiotic condition. And what was also very, uh, very striking to us is even on such short period of time, so just by consuming CMC over a period of two weeks, this is sufficient to decrease macrobiota diversity. So we know that macrobiota diversity is very important and you need to keep the, the macrobiota diversity as high as possible. You see this is definitely the case, the case in the control uh, group in, in blue, but as soon as participants start to, to um, consume CMC, they have a loss of bacterial species, they have, uh, they have a lot of richness in the intestinal macrobiota, which is, which, which is quite, uh, quite uh, uh, striking. And we also looked at, at the fecal uh, metabolome in this study, and, and what we observed is, uh, here was also uh, highly uh, interesting. So this is only the control uh, group uh, over time, so every single row is uh, one day, and uh, you move to the bottom, you, you, you are going uh, through the study, and you can see that the fecal metabolome is actually pretty stable over time. While if you look at the CMC-treated participants during the CMC exposure period, you can see that we have a very, very profound depletion of numerous metabolites in, in the gastrointestinal tract of, of those participants. And here again, we know that most of those metabolites are very important to promote intestinal health. And again, on such short number of participants over a short period of time, we are able to deplete most of these health promoter uh, metabolites. So it's very, very striking and, and very promising for, for, for future research. And uh, we, we were also able in, in this study to collect uh, colonoscopy. So we performed colonoscopy in, in those participants, both pre and post uh, diet. And what we observed here was that for most of the uh, CMC treated participants, we did not observe any microbiota encroachment. But what was interesting is that for two of them, we observed a pretty striking microbiota encroachment. So it's uh, again perfectly fit with the concept, but we are not going, we are very likely not going all to respond the same. Uh, to emulsifier exposure, and, and there is very likely in this room some, some participants that are, that are going to be highly insensitive to uh, carboxymethyl cellulose and very likely other emulsifier exposure, while some participants will be highly uh, sensitive to such exposure. And uh, of course, the, the question relates also to the tool that we, 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 we can do and to the tools that we can use, and, and if we want to do this type of clinical studies and this type of preclinical studies using mice, to test all the additives that are currently being used is, is, is going to take a, a lot of time and, and a lot of money. So we decided to use another approach by using an, an in vitro microbiota system to see if this is going to apply to, to other additives. Uh, because again, most of them are going to be used in combination and, and very often uh, if you take a package of, of processed food, you will find uh, five, five to 10 uh, dietary emulsifiers that are, that are incorporated into it. So we, needed, we wanted to test uh, most of them as well as the cocktail effect. 
So for this, we set up in the lab an in vitro microbiota system, which I think can be uh, very, very important for us to generate a lot of data. Because here, you don't need any mice, you don't need any human. You, you can uh, actually here, in every single of those chamber, reproduce an in vitro microbiota system uh, from human and test the impact of various uh, food additives. And this is uh, what uh, Sabrine uh, did in, in the lab, and, and this is what she obtained. So basically, she was able to reproduce. Uh, the, so this is kind of a dysbiosis index. So the upper is going, the more detrimental uh, the effect was on the microbiota. And you can clearly see that she was able to reproduce what we observed before for CMC and P80. And when she used uh, numerous other uh, dietary emulsifiers, you can clearly see that not all emulsifiers are acting the same. Some of them seems to be uh, highly inno inoffensive and do not have uh, driving any impact, detrimental impact on, on the microbiota, while some of them, such as carrageenan in red, seems to be uh, much more detrimental compared to CMC and P80. So it's, to me, really fascinating that not only not all the microbiota are going to respond to, food to those food additives, but also that within those class of food additives, they're not going to act the same on the intestinal microbiota, and, and this is something we are actively, uh, actively working on. So this is uh, the conclusion slides I, I wanted to bring, where uh, this is, um, I, I think, where, where we are currently, where uh, in select individual, if you consume select dietary emulsifiers, this is going to stress the microbiota, uh, decrease its diversity, increase its ability to penetrate the normally sterile mucus layer in a way that's going to drive chronic intestinal inflammation that can manifest as colitis if you have genetic susceptibility or diabetes and obesity if you do not have any uh, genetic uh, susceptibility. And so it's, it can seem so, it can um, appear a little bit complex here, but uh, what we are currently doing uh, is, is giving us a lot of hope because what we are uh, currently doing is trying to combine all of those data. And what we can do right now, and, and this is so far working pretty well, is we can actually predict who is going to be uh, impacted or not by various food additives. You can clearly see here that if we take a microbiota from a participant that's fully insensitized to a CMC, we are able to reproduce this in our in vitro microbiota system. And if we do the same by taking microbiota from uh, a person that clinically detrimentally responds to CMC, we are also able to reproduce this response in our in vitro microbiota system. So it means that we are currently building a platform where we will be able to test individual microbiota, expose them to individual food additives to determine who is going to be highly uh, detrimentally impacted by a given uh, food additives. And with that, just wanted to finish with uh, a few take home messages. Uh, where dietary emulsifiers, we demonstrated that can, they can directly impact uh, the intestinal microbiota in, in a detrimental way, both uh, compositionally and functionally, uh, in a way that's going to promote chronic uh, inflammatory diseases. Uh, again, what's, what's very important, I think, is that not all the, the dietary emulsifiers are going to detrimentally impact the microbiota, so I think in, in a relatively short term, we'll be able to use in vitro, uh, for example, in vitro uh, microbiota system in order to test a lot of food additives and to determine which one are the more detrimental uh, for the intestinal microbiota. And in, in a longer uh, term, we, we should be able to use also our knowledge on, on the interindividual variation on the microbiota and use our screening approach in order to define what we call microbiota-based personalized medicine in a way that we'll be able to screen microbiota to determine who is susceptible and who is resistant to a given uh, stressor of the microbiota, emulsifiers again being one example of, of, the, of such, a, such a stressor. And with that, of course, this is a highly collaborative work, so we have a lot of collaborators worldwide as, as well as a lot of agency uh, supporting this work, and, and I really thank you for your attention. Thank you. say that I am reading all your questions and they're fantastic and when we have our QA in just a couple minutes I'm going to get to them but I there we will get to these terrific questions well it's my pleasure to invite uh, Martin Ball the floor speaker is an excellent science and also an excellent colleague he got the PhD in microbiology from the University of Copenhagen later on uh, had a senior position as researcher at the Gut Microbes and Health Research Group at the National Food Institute of Technical University of Denmark, where he was working until now. And he has uh, lead very, uh, a number of projects, uh, some very related uh, to the topic today, uh, and focus on the role of xenobiotics uh, on the microbial communities in the intestine. The time is yours. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction and for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, so I'd like to start somewhere else. Out in, in nature, there are many fascinating examples of close symbiotic interactions between microbes 
and a host organism. And one that springs to mind is the light organ on the Hawaiian bobtail squid that you might have seen, uh, where the light organ is actually fueled by a bacteria, which is bioluminescent. Now, humans, we don't have anything fancy like light organs. Our bacteria, our microorganisms, they are kind of a bit more hidden. But we do have bacteria, and we have a lot of them. So probably you've heard these statistics saying that you are 50% or even maybe 90% bacteria and only 10% human. Um, and this is true. And even more surprising, we actually have a, a situation where the bacterial genes outnumber the human genes by a factor of about 100. So it's important also to appreciate that, that there's been a co evolution of the bacterial communities, especially in our gut, I'll be focusing on uh, today, uh, and us as, uh, as, as host organisms. And this goes back in this example for, for, for all mammals, and the first mammal appeared around 250 million years ago. And this co-evolution is really nicely demonstrated uh, in this PCOA plot, which is the same kind of uh, plot that, that Jack was showing earlier, where we have uh, around 50 individual animals, mammals, their microbiota, gut microbiota, and that's plotted here uh, showing similarity. So for each uh, individual animal, there's one spot, and the closer they are related, the closer the spots will be in the, in the plot. And they're then also color co uh, coded according to the taxonomy of the animal. And as you can see, we have a very nice clustering. So the carnivores down to the left, the red ones, and then we have the, the herbivores, the green ones, and the primates being the blue ones, including us as humans. So co-evolution has been taking place. To add to the complexity, apart from differences between animal species in the microbiota, we also have quite a lot actually a whole lot of variation in the microbiota within us as humans. So in this room, everyone will have a, a, a distinct microbiota composition, both in terms of what species you contain, approximately 200 species uh, for each of you, uh, but also the relative abundances of these species. As you can see in the top here on the left, uh, the two main phyla, this very high level of, of taxonomy, the Firmicutes and the Bacteroidetes, can actually vary quite significantly between healthy individuals. And this is also uh, makes it difficult to actually pinpoint and to say what constitutes a healthy microbiota. There has been some, some attempts to, to try to stratify or to group into, into categories, these entrotypes, as you can see to the right, uh, but in reality, it's probably more like a, a landscape of different microbiotas that are found in, uh, in healthy individuals. Um, but this co-evolution has given the opportunity to develop cross-talk between the microbes and the host organism. And this is indeed what has happened. And we're really uh, gaining more and more knowledge into the many, many uh, interactions that are taking place. So microbial messengers signaling to the, to the host organism. And this is just an overview of, uh, of some of these mechanisms related to host metabolism. And you'll recognize the short chain fatty acids, which have been mentioned already, the butyrate, and the LPS is also in here, uh, which was mentioned uh, by, by Jack as well. Um, for each of these approximately 200 bacterial species that we are each are carrying around, there might be multiple interactions with the host. This is just for one species, the E. coli, and, uh, and here we have at least three known mechanisms in which the, the, the coli might affect appetite regulation. Um, and actually, we, we, we tested, tested this out in a study where we increased the number of, of, of coli by, by treating uh, rats with, uh, with antibiotics and saw a very nice increase or, or change in, uh, in, in the PYY gene, which is one of these satiatory hormones. So we have a situation where the bacteria are clearly having an effect on the host organism in many, many different ways. But the thing is that, that a lot of different components, both dietary choices, but also xenobiotics uh, in early infancy, formula milk, breast milk, 
and, and later on maybe the choice of, of diet, if it's fiber rich, if it's, uh, if it's rich in sugars and so on, will affect the bacterial community composition. And this kind of gives rise to, to this cascade of, of quite blunt uh, statements on the right, uh, where ingestion of almost any compound will result in a measurable change in the gut microbiota, so long as the exposure is high enough and you have enough statistical power. Uh, and the second step will then be that any change in the microbiota will result in, in a measurable change in the, in the microbial metabolite profile. Again, uh, if, if you have enough power and if the change in composition is, is large enough. And the third step here is that any change in specific microbial uh, metabolite uh, will result in a change in the associated host target response. Um, again, so, so long as we have enough power to, 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 uh, to actually see that in our uh, experiment or trial. So the question is, and, the, and maybe also the key problem, which microbiota disturbances are actually problematic in real life? Uh, so here I've tried to, 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 to put in a, a, a figure to illustrate uh, a microbiota which is fluctuating in the green area due to different dietary choices that you make. Maybe one day you have a lot of meat, another day a lot of vegetables and so on. So there'll be some natural fluctuation. Um, and this could be in, within an acceptable range. Then you have a yellow situation getting close to the, to the border, but moving into the red, maybe kind of uh, going to, to the border and jumping off the side uh, to, to, to the red area here, uh, a change in microbiota associated with an actual adverse effect. And that's what I like to call a microbiota disruption. Uh, so disturbance versus disruption where you actually have an adverse effect. And there's a definition for the endocrine disruptors uh, from WHO, which is actually quite useful to, to, to substitute with the, with the microbiota wording. And so, so that's what I've done in the bottom left here, saying a microbiota disrupting compound uh, is an exogenous substance or mixture that's at relevant concentrations, alters the composition and or activity of the microbial community. And consequently, and here the word consequently is obviously important, causes adverse health effects in the host. Uh, so two important things here, consequently, and also that it's at relevant uh, concentrations that we're dealing with. And again, how do we figure this out? Well, one way could be to, to, to look in to different bacterial species, how are they changing and so on, or maybe even look at these a bit higher level dysbiosis indexes which, uh, which exist. And then moving on to, to try to, to, to answer the question, is the gut microbiota involved in chemical toxicity? And, and back to the question of causation. So if we have uh, some compound here, xenobiotic compound, and we have an adverse effect associated with this compound, there are sort of three scenarios. The green one here is that we have an effect, adverse effect, which is not caused by changes in the gut microbiota. We might see changes in the gut microbiota, but it's not linked to the adverse effect. The middle situation is, is, is where we have a change in gut microbiota, which is causative to the, to the adverse health effect. And on the right, we have uh, the third situation where an adverse health effect is actually uh, accentuated by the, by the gut microbiota. And I'll get back to the last point at the end of the, the presentation. Now focusing uh, on the middle one here. So one compound which has uh, attracted some attention uh, in later years uh, in terms of, of maybe uh, affecting the gut microbiota is glyphosate, the active uh, compound in, in, in commercial products such as uh, Roundup. And this is because the mode of action of glyphosate is known. We know that glyphosate inhibits a specific reaction in the shikimata pathway, which is generating the aromatic amino acids, so tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. This pathway is found in plants. That's why it works as a herbicide. It's not found in humans. That's why at least some think that it's, uh, it's uh, safe to use. There's lots of debate on that area I won't get into. Uh, but the pathway is also present in bacteria which are found in the gut. And there's been quite a number of in vitro studies showing that 
glyphosate works as an antibiotic, so if you're adding the glyphosate, you are inhibiting growth of the, of the gut bacteria. We set up a trial to, to investigate this uh, a few years ago in a, in a rodent model in, uh, in rats. And surprisingly, what we found was that glyphosate actually had quite limited effect on the bacterial composition in these rats, even up to a concentration of 50 times the, the, the ADI. And um, the conclusion from this study was that sufficient levels of, of uh, aromatic amino acids in the intestine alleviated the antibiotic effect. So the fact that we already had all these aromatic uh, amino acids at, at high enough sufficient concentrations meant that we didn't really uh, see a, a, a detrimental effect, dysbiotic or uh, effect of, uh, of, the, of the glyphosate in these rats. We did see a few other interesting observations, uh, change in pH and actually uh, also uh, a concurrent change in the level of acetic acid, uh, acetate in the, in the animals, which is, which is probably related to, to bacterial activity. Another situation where we clearly see effects of the compound on the microbiota, uh, of course, the antibiotics. And we've heard at this conference a number uh, of times that antibiotics are problematic due to, to, to antibiotic resistance. but. Uh, we should also consider that antibiotics are problematic because they have severe uh, and acute effects on the microbiota. And this is shown uh, some results from a, from a small animal trial in, 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 in our department, uh, where you can see to the right here, uh, animals uh, in the control group on the left, uh, and in a group where we on day zero dosed with, a, with, with a amoxicillin. Um, a beta-lactam antibiotic. And immediately, the day after, you see a massive change in, in microbiota composition, um, which is, is also mirrored in the diversity, and you can see on the left, uh, becoming very low. So the question is, do such effects actually matter for human health? And of course, this is a, a research uh, area which has, has, has attracted a lot of attention for, 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 for many years and many articles uh, are, are published on this issue. This is just one of them, showing that early life antibiotic uh, exposure has effects on a number of health outcomes, uh, asthma being uh, one of them, where the risk of developing asthma increases with, uh, with antibiotic uh, consumption in early life. And early life is really an important window for, 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 for modulating or, or disruption of the, of the microbiota because that's where uh, this successional development is, uh, is taking place. But again, establishing causality. So in studies like this, there might be a reason why the, the infants got the, the antibiotic. It might be because, or it was because they were sick uh, of something else and therefore were, were, were prescribed antibiotics. So it's always important to, 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 to make sure that the causality is there, that we know that it's a change in the microbiota composition, which is actually leading to the, to the effects that we're seeing. Now, the gold standard uh, has become the use of germ-free animals uh, in this kind of study, where, as has been mentioned also previously uh, today, uh, you can take the disturbed, disrupted microbiota, transfer that to sterile germ-free animals, and then see whether you can actually transfer the phenotype at the same time. And, and this is done in, in many groups uh, across Europe and the world to, to, to demonstrate causality. Um, could also defer to more, could say, old school uh, methods, the Bradford Hill criteria, try to develop those further to, to, to use, to based on observations, uh, establish uh, at least some high probability of, uh, of, of causality. So the last part uh, of my talk is, is on the third scenario here, the, the adverse health effects accentuated by the gut microbiota. And here I'm thinking of things like the, the, the gut microbiota is known to induce transformation of, uh, of many xenobiotics. Uh, so partial degradation within the gut environment may be generating more uh, uh, problematic uh, forms of the molecules. Uh, the gut microbiota may affect uh, uptake and 
could also affect things like transition time, how long time does it take for the, for the compound to go through, which could affect uptake and so on. Um, so recently we conducted uh, in, in, in our department this, uh, this uh, first study really to, to look at this kind of effect. Uh, and it was for the, for the xenobiotic uh, peat fuss, which has uh, also attracted much attention uh, lately, where we dosed uh, animals with, uh, with, with peat fuss. Um, and what we wanted to see was whether changing the microbiota of these animals would affect the, 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 the peat fuss uh, exposure. Um, so we know that PFOS has an effect on, tyroid, on the thyroid hormone system, uh, and we wanted to understand whether the microbiota was involved in this. So we therefore had these four groups where half of them were dosed with, uh, with antibiotic, uh, vancomycin in this uh, instance, um, and half not, and crossover with also uh, the, the PFOS. Uh, so we could figure out what was going on. And first, you can see that the vancomycin had a, a profound effect, as expected, on the, on the alpha diversity uh, in these uh, rats, and also on the beta diversity on the right-hand side, where you can see the community, bacterial community of the rats dosed with vancomycin was a lot different from the rats which were not dosed with, uh, with vancomycin. Did this then have any effect uh, on, on, uh, on the PFOS uh, exposure? And the short answer to that is uh, not so. Um, so we saw, as expected, a decrease in the, in the T3 and the T4 uh, hormone compounds here, and, and, uh, which is expected and not new. Uh, but what was interesting was that we did not see any difference in the animals dosed with and without uh, antibiotic in, uh, in this study. We would really like to continue this work uh, looking at other compounds than, uh, than PFOS uh, in, the in the future. We did see a small effect uh, on the liver weight uh, based on, 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 on uh, vanco or as an effect of uh, vancomycin treatment. So this is my, my final slide with uh, some future uh, considerations and directions. Uh, probably uh, we, we can't answer all of them, but they're nice to have uh, on the board. Does the chemical cause disruption of the gut microbiota is, a, is an important question. So disruption actually meaning that there's some, some host effect, maybe some standardizations are needed, maybe it's possible to, 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 to use biomarkers, specific bacterial groups, or maybe metabolites to look into this could use the dysbiosis indexes, uh, and importantly, define a biological relevant change, not just a significant change. And the second point here is about causality. Uh, this is really an important uh, issue or aspect if you want to, 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 to say that the microbiota is, uh, is, is causative. Um, and the last point here is to do with standardization, that we feel that it's really important for toxicity studies in animals to, to, to move towards standardizing their gut microbiota. So when you, we are dosing with the, with, the, with the xenobiotics, they are meeting the same, or, or at least we know something about the, the microbiota that they will be meeting in the uh, animals. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, these are some acknowledgements. Thank you. Thank you so. So. Come on up and have a seat. I, I, I have been told that we are going to keep the QA, the 10 minute QA, and then have a little bit shorter break. That's this official note that came to me. Is that? We have spent all the time we have available. I know. Well, so I, uh, uh, and at least a couple of questions. A couple questions. Have a seat. Really interesting then to come have. on up. And maybe we can uh, raise the lights a little bit because that way uh, you guys uh, can get a little solar exposure out there. Who remembers the first time you learned that there was a microbiome and that you had one? Does anybody remember where they were when they discovered that? I do, I remember exactly. Yeah, like it was anybody who's older than 30, you know, it was this sudden realization that you weren't traveling alone through the universe. I mean, I, when I started in medicine, I didn't even know about the microbiome. 
Uh, and it suddenly was there as this companion that I was apparently hauling around with me everywhere. Uh, and that had this profound effect, not just on me, but my patients and on the universe. And um, it, uh, I can imagine that especially if you're working in risk assessment, it's this total paradigm shift where all of a sudden you have to start thinking about these other creatures that aren't even really a part of us. It's like discovering all of a sudden that we had an accessory organ like a liver or a heart or something that you have to take care of. Um, but I love, thank you both, those were wonderful talks. And uh, I love what Martin said. He said, uh, which microbiota uh, disturbances are problematic in real life? And uh, that is kind of what we're trying to figure out here. Um, so uh, with that, Benoit, we have a whole bunch of questions about these emulsifiers. Um, first of all, can you tell us what dose you were giving your mice and then your humans, for example, was it the amount that was in the gelato that I had last night? Or is it like 10 gelatos? Or just give us an idea of where we are with these emulsifiers. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very important point. So everything we did so far on mice and human were really focusing on, on single additives at a time and not the cocktail effect. So we used some pretty high uh, dose in order to mimic the exposure to the various food additives. What's, what's pretty interesting is in mice, even by decreasing the level to, to those that are actually found in, 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 in the food, we were still uh, observing the same effect. So, so there is some true relevance of that. What's also very interesting is that not, the, not all, every single dietary emulsifier is going to act through different ways. So for example, CMC is really impacting gene expression by, by the microbiota. PAT, it's more able to kill select microbiota member and to favor the growth of other one. So you can also think about synergistic effect and by maybe by decreasing, and this is something we are currently doing, by decreasing the dose by quite a while, but combining those compounds, you can have the synergistic effect and, and still observe the same, the, the same, the same detrimental impact. Aha, uh because -huh. so we have this whole holster of food emulsifiers. We can add little bits of each. Uh, I noted from your slide that guar gum and carrageenan were not, uh, not doing so well either. Um, following up on that uh, quickly uh, was the question of what happens if we take those emulsifiers and put them in a, in, in a food context rather than just feeding them as a pure emulsifier. Yes, Might that make a difference and uh, have you looked at that at all? So yeah, we have, looked, we have looked at that and by putting the, the dietary emulsifiers directly within the food matrix, it's driving exactly the same impact in terms of altering microbiota composition, localization and pro-inflammatory potential. In human also, the, the CMC that we administered to human was directly um, put into the food matrix. So yeah, we, we observed very similar effect when we put dietary emulsifiers within the food matrix. What would be the impact of various uh, food matrix? What if it's a high fat diet compared to um, a high fiber diet or high fat? We, we have no idea about that. But yeah, by putting them within the food matrix, we observe exactly the same effect as within the drinking water. Great. I'm realizing that we have a bunch of very practical thinkers out there. Uh, a question that came up a number of times, not just in this context, but also with the soil and other things, is what happens if we get the right combination of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and use them to replace a disruption? Will that help things? And I'm going to let uh, uh, Martin take this one. OK, thank you. Is, is this one? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so in some instances, the answer is clearly yes. We've been doing uh, some collaboration with a, a hospital in, uh, in Aarhus in, in Denmark where they're treating uh, C. difficile patients with fecal microbiota transplantation. And it's astounding and impressive uh, how large an effect you can get from these FMT treatments. So they have patients who've been through rounds of vancomycin treatment, Daxis uh, mycin, which, uh, which are the first line treatments for, for C. difficile infection, and they are, they are having recurrent uh, C. difficile, and then offered uh, the option to have an FMT treatment. And the percentage of those who recover uh, are in the high 80s or 90s. So, so here we, are, we, are, we have a, a dysbiotic microbiota, and we know that because we've actually been, been, been looking into what the microbiota looks like of these patients. And we are giving a healthy microbiota from a, from a donor. Uh, and then we are seeing within days uh, recovery. 
and this is sustained recovery. So for many of the patients, they do not uh, have, have, have more issues, basically, they, they, they fully recover. Uh, and what is interesting is that if we sample the patients six months after the FMC treatment, then actually quite a lot of the donor strains are still present. So whether that's worrying or not, uh, I'm not quite Who sure. Who knows? <laughs> um, so I would love, Jack, for there, uh, that question came up a number of times with regard to the soil as well. And those uh, the first studies that you mentioned in the grapevines, uh, whether, and also I guess with the uh, fertilizer application, uh, whether there was an opportunity to do the same kind of therapeutic that Martin was describing with the soil and actually reverse some of the soil dysbiosis that they've seen. Oh, I think you're on mute. Please now show me. You're not on mute. No. Oh, Can you oh hear me? there you are. Ah, now no, ah, I hear you. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so obviously I, I mentioned the addition of mycorrhizal fungi, um, uh -huh. which is essentially a targeted uh, soil microbiota transplant. But there are efforts underway to take healthy soils from particular areas of farms and use them to repopulate uh, damaged soils um, in and other areas. So that would be more akin to a fecal microbiome transplant, as was mentioned. But this this uh, this idea is is taking hold. So you, you can go down to most um, most uh, um, uh, agricultural centres or, or gardening centres and pick up uh, probiotic formulations to add into the soil when you're planting your plants in your backyard. So um, using it in a more robust way to in industrial agricultural applications um, in large scale farms like we have here in the US um, is a really interesting way of improving carbon sequestration and carbon content in soils and reducing the impacts of uh, climate change more broadly. We believe that if we get the entire U.S. agricultural system turned over to a, uh, a microbiome-centric agricultural policy, um, which, which will promote carbon accumulation in a reaccumulation in the soils of, um, of the Midwest, for example, um, we could reduce our uh, carbon emissions by uh, um, a substantial fraction, over 30 to 35 percent, uh, which would be phenomenal. Uh I, I have always thought that microbes would save the world, so that's very helpful to hear. Um, I, my last question, if the three of you could answer it very quickly, uh, and then we'll let everybody go to break, um, is are there um, studies, and I'm wondering actually if Benoit, you have done this, where they have then, remo you know, that is actually a, a trial, preferably in humans, but maybe in mice, that's all we got, where uh, an insult has been given, we've seen a disruption in the microbiome, then they've removed the insult and we've seen things go back so that we really do have proof uh, that it was the microbiome that was both the instigator and then removing it improves things. Um, for example, with your CMC study, did you happen to do any follow-up and see if those poor people got better when you took away their gelato? Yeah, so we are, I mean, the, the study that we just published on, on human was just not, not, not enough, uh, we were not have, having enough participants to do that, but this is something we're going to do on, on a much larger clinical study on, on IBD patients. But yeah, in mice, we looked at the reversibility and, and yeah, most of the effect, as, as soon as we removed the dietary multivirus, most of the effect on the macrobiota were switching back to, to the normal, uh, normal state. Uh, we lost most of the dysbiotic uh, marker. In terms of phenotype of the animals, uh, meaning uh, metabolism and, and chronic inflammation, some of the l alterations were still there. So yeah, it seems that removing such uh, uh, stress of the microbiota can, can be reversible in some way in terms of microbiota composition and function, but very likely for some aspect on inflammation and metabolism is going to be too late. Terrific. What do you yeah, have so I can answer as well, uh, based on uh, some studies that we've been doing with antibiotics, uh, which is clearly disturbing and disrupting uh, the, the, the microbiota. And, and here, for the most part, we and others are seeing a recovery of the, of the microbiota. Uh, but there are some concerns that not, even though it looks as if in the, in the PCRA plots, as we've been seeing, that, that most of the recovery is taking place. If you look a little bit deeper, then sometimes 
some of the specific uh, species or OTUs or ASVs uh, might uh, not reappear, so, so might actually become distinct, extinct. Uh, and this is kind of feeds into the to the missing microbes uh, theory and, and, and problems, which is uh, has been raised by Martin uh, Blaze, uh, Professor Martin Blaze. And Jack, we'll give you the last word and then go to break here. Yeah, so I'd like to just give you a, a story um, about to, to, well, 30, 40 years ago, nearly everybody in the United States was being born with um, about 60, 65 percent of them were being born with uh, bacteria in the gut that could digest breast milk. A um, hundred years ago, it was close to 100 percent of the children. Now it's actually close to about 10 percent of the children. And we believe that that, that missing microbes angle um, uh, that you had mentioned just then um, is a, a very good indication of continuous exposure to antibiotics, poor diet and additives and um, ex environmental pollutants, which may be reducing the abundance of these critical organisms. In fact, the re-addition of the Phytobacterium longum infantis tends to rescue those participants, but they don't get better on themselves. We don't see the Phytobacterium longum infantis coming back into our populations just randomly. Terrific. Well, um, I think we're going to go uh, oh, have oh, a oh, cup oh. of coffee right now, uh, especially for us who are still on California time. And we'll be back here at what time? At the... Uh, 3.50. Uh, 3.50. 10 to 4. Okay. If possible. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So the finding or my presentation are my opinion. It does not reflect the views of US Food and Drug Administration. And any mention of the commercial product is for qualification only and not intended as approval, endorsement, or the recommendation. So the outline of my presentation consists as follow. First, I will be giving you the strategic plan and goal of the microbiome program at US FDA. Then the tested chemicals and xenobiotic of interest to health, environment, and society. I'll give a brief introduction about it. Then the capabilities and endpoints in the microbiome area, how we can use them in the risk assessment. Then some highlights of my research I'll be giving that has been obtained using the animal model, non-animal model, and also with these results, how the construction of decision tree for the microbiome analysis during the perturbation with the xenobiotic can be conducted. Uh, these um, results will lead some of the questions that are arise from my presentation, and then we'll move with the path forward. So the strategic plan for the microbiome research is based on the predictive toxicology roadmap that is defined for the FDA-regulated product. And it requires the acceptable daily intake um, hazard assessment and to see whether no adverse effect is observed and also to see the possible developmental and the reproductive toxicity. So based on this, FDA has defined its uh, document in which, as you can see towards the right, the microbiome research is one of the priority area, and this is all, uh, this regulation to be tested throughout the life cycle of this compound. And apart from FDA, we have other 22 federal agencies that are uh, conducting research, and these are interagency strategic plan for the microbiome research. And these address for the human uh, health safety, food production, and ecosystem services. So the uh, goal of my uh, research program is to predict the systemic toxicity via microbiome and gut mucosa associated responses. And to do this, we have used the bottom-up approaches and also the top-down approaches. And to, um, this led us to determine if the microbiome is adversely impacted by the xenobiotic exposure. 
and to develop the translational approaches and finally to build the decision tree for the toxicological evaluation of the microbiome. So several uh, xenobiotic we have studied um, and we have looked for the xenobiotic microbe host interaction. And these compounds were selected based on the combined effort of US FDA and National Toxicological Program that is under the auspices of the National Health Institute. For this, we have used the environmental pollutants, additives, nanomaterial, and antimicrobial residues. Apart from this, we have also used the animal model to test the vehicle because several drugs that are not soluble in the water are used in the vehicle, and whether that rodent model are appropriate testing model to define the toxicity, we have conducted those studies. And also we have used the disease model using the collaborative cross animal H1, in which you can see the genetic diversity and also the transgenic animal to study the extra intestinal effects, uh, how the microbiome can play into the, these animals. And specifically uh, for uh, collaborative cross animal, we have looked for the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and for transgenic, we have looked for the Alzheimer disease. Uh, this all is basically effort towards the One Health program that is the main aim of this conference also. Today I'll be talking results of three, uh, that is arsenic, triclosane, and the silver nanoparticles. The research models that are used in our lab are uh, several, like in vitro uh, exposure of the live bacterial cultures when we look for the xenobiotic microbe interaction. And also we look for the in vitro culture into uh, using the feces as has been also defined by earlier speaker. Then we also use the in vivo model and also the ex vivo model using the human intestinal or colon explant. There are several uh, endpoints that are mentioned here. And then what we look is that who is there and what they are doing. And as far as the um, research models for the xenobiotic host interaction, we look for the in vitro single cell model, then organoid culture, then animal exposure using different strategy like exposure route, gestational exposure, developmental exposure, duration of exposure, and also the ex vivo exposure. Similarly, like we have for the microbiome study using the human ileal and colon explant. Now here, our aim is to look for the relevant in vitro system and how we can have the appropriate translational model. So the integrated approach that we use here, get data from the host as well as microbiome and do the systemic data analysis. Um, and uh, this is a very um, big chart, but I will come back to this for the decision tree at the end of the talk. So today I'll be talking about the animal model and the non-animal model. In the animal model, I will be giving you example for the route of exposure, in which we have used the oral exposure as well as intravenous exposure for the arsenic that is one of the very prevalent uh, environmental toxicant present in our um, environment, basically. Uh, and that will show the bypass of the first pass metabolism importance of uh, this uh, organ like gastrointestinal tract. Second, we will look for the developmental exposure for the triclosane. Third, we will look the in vitro model for the um, gastrointestinal tract in which we will be looking the uh, intestinal epithelial cells, both at the xenobiotic microbe interaction and also the xenobiotic host interaction and how this can be then used to establish the ex vivo model that is more human relevant that we get from the uh, human intestinal tract. So I'll start um, the evidence-based analysis basically using the route of exposure for the um, arsenic. And for this, we have used the single exposure of the sodium arsenic. Uh, and animals were either given the oral gavage or they were injected intravenously. Uh, and the animals were sacrificed either 24 or 48 hours later in the oral exposure or one for 24 hour and 48 hour post exposure in the intravenous 
So here, um, I'm not giving all the heat maps for the 16S analysis, but I'm just giving the examples of the differentially abundant uh, microbes, those who are present during the oral exposure. And as you can see, most of the functions of these microbes are related with the bacterial invasion. Whereas when we look for the bacterial species uh, into the intravenous exposure, what we found the functions related to the, uh, these species that were abundant were related with the disruption of the uh, first protective layer or the disruption in the cell-cell junction uh, or the epithelial uh, cells. So this led us to believe that route of exposure may lead to the abundance of bacterial species that could provide clue for the host mucosal responses. So then we went ahead in the same animal, we looked for the ileal mucosa and we looked two different parameters now. First is the cell-cell junction, uh, mRNA expression for those, and second for the signaling and inflammatory responses. What we see in the oral exposure that there was no perturbation of the cell-cell junction related gene. Whereas for the uh, signaling and inflammatory responses, there was significant perturbation of the immune response related gene during one single exposure. Now, when we look for the IV exposure, we can see here clearly with the time there was down regulation of cell cell junctions related gene during the, uh, during the um, uh, IV exposure. And there was only a transient impact onto the signaling and inflammatory molecule um, in the IV exposure. So this led us to believe that route of exposure of arsenic caused differential responses for host immune responses and the permeability. And then we correlated this with the, how the arsenic is metabolized into the gastrointestinal tract. So as you can see towards your left, basically during the oral exposure, uh, arsenic is getting metabolized by the intestinal microbes and it is getting converted into the more toxic trivalent and pentavalent species that we found in the, our animals. Whereas during the intravenous exposure, there was the bypass of the first pass metabolism and there was not such a species and they did not have any immunotoxic effect. But because they were passing through the gastrointestinal tract, through the mesenteric vessel, they had the um, impact onto the intestinal permeability. So the next example that I'm giving is for the developmental exposure, and for that I have used the triclosine. So this triclosine was used into the adult animal from the gestation day six. Some animals were sacrificed during the gestation day 18. And uh, then when pups were born, pups were um, sacrificed on postnatal day 28. And whereas the dams were uh, sacrificed on to the postnatal, um, postpartum 28 days. And then we have done analysis for the uh, who is there and what they are doing uh, in context of the microbiome. So here you can see the developmental exposure of triclosane. And here it clearly shows that there was a high abundance of proteobacteria in these animals. And we can see that effect starting from the GD18. And then we were also able to see that into the male and female pups um, that there was high abundance of the proteobacteria. It is one of the pathogenic species that was found to be highly abundant. Uh, then we uh, looked at the genus level and when we grouped the dose, what we found that uh, triclosane had uh, dose depending impact, a uh, gradual shift into the abundance of the bacterial population. Uh, then we looked also the metatranscriptomics, like what these bacteria are now doing there. And here are some of the examples how they may be playing role into the total functional profiling. What we can see that effect of TCS can be seen as GD18. We can see that uh, several genes related to the human diseases were upregulated. Then also we were able to see in the pups uh, sex dependent effect, male and female showed different profile. 
uh, for the human disease related gene and also for the metabolism related gene. Uh, the result that I'm not showing here is the xenobiotic metabolism of the triclosane, but what we found that male pups had highly metabolic activity in comparison to the female, and that may be leading to the lower uh, xenobiotic metabolism could cause the more accumulation of triclosane into the female. So this uh, clearly shows that there was developmental exposure to the triclosane uh, shows the changes into the status of genes during the gestation itself. So next, um, the rest of the talk will be on to the silver nanoparticle safety assessment. And this we have used very extensively for uh, animal model and also in the non-animal model. And why we are looking for the silver nanoparticle? Because this is one of the um, supplement that is available in the open market. People use it as uh, it is uh, shown as effective killer for the gram positive and gram negative bacteria. But how does the, this uh, distinguish between pathogenic and non-pathogenic? We wanted to know that. And also in FDA database, there is a lot of adverse even reporting for this, uh, uh, this uh, silver uh, supplement basically. So uh, for this, our aim was whether uh, the gastrointestinal tract microbiome is impacted and whether there is crosstalk between the microbiome and the host, looking for the epithelial permeability and also for the gut-associated immune responses. So here we are going to do the in vivo, in vitro, and ex vivo correlation. So first, looking for the um, animal model, what we were able to see that when we use three different sizes of nanoparticle, the smallest is 10 nanometer, then 75 nanometer, and 110 nanometer. So a smaller size of nanoparticle had more microbicidal impact as compared to the larger sizes of nanoparticle. Then uh, we looked, um, we saw that, okay, this is causing uh, impact on the live bacteria. We went ahead and did the 16S sequencing and uh, here I'm giving just some representative bacteria abundance. What we saw that uh, Archimensia, that is the mucin degrading bacteria was in higher abundance in the female. Allobacterium that is involved into the intestinal permeability and also the parabacteroides that is involved into the immune status health also differential abundance in male and female. Now, when we looked for the female tight junction and male or female both rather tight junction related gene, what we found it was very much uh, in coordination with how the uh, uh, archimensia was there. So archimensia because it degrades the mucin, you can see that there was a high impact on the tight junction in the female. Uh, then we wanted to see if we can use this into the in vitro system, like several agencies are now moving from animal to non-animal models. So first we wanted to see whether there is impact on the microbiome. So for the microbiome effect, we looked the individual bacteria, and here I'm giving you example of two, the bacteroides and lactobacillus representing gram negative and gram positive commensal bacteria. And again, we were able to reflect the same results that a small size of nanoparticle had uh, more bactericidal activity as compared to the larger size. Um, then another component that we have studied in this, uh, in this uh, whole system is that we have incubated the fecal sample with the silver nanoparticle and looked for the effect on the virome. So because virus is also one of the important component of the um, microbiome, so what we see here that there is differential abundance of the phages that prey on to the pathogenic bacteria and they were actually decreased. So once these bacteria are decreased, that means pathogenic bacteria will be higher into the system. Uh, and then from the host side, in vitro system we have used, and we saw that uh, you can see in the immunohistochemistry that is in the middle uh, part of this uh, slide, uh, there was a decrease in the mucin secretion due to the low size of the uh, nanoparticle. 
And this system actually is a transwell system in which cells are grown into the, uh, into the uh, transwell and they have the apical and basal compartment reflecting the oral or the, um, or the basal exposure that is related to the intravenous exposure. And then when we looked for the um, uh, cell cell junction related genes, we were able to see that 10 nanometer caused the uh, increase in the cell junction uh, uh, permeability, as you can see here, due to the destruction of the mesial layer. So now we wanted to go for the ex vivo model. For this, we took the, um, we took the um, gastrointestinal tract uh, uh, from the um, human and then they were incubated with the nanoparticle. We were able to see that nanoparticle were present into the mucosa, and then they also presented the differential abundance of the uh, bacteria that were also found into the in vivo system. So now based on this, we have come into a decision tree for the evaluation of the GI toxicity. So it starts with the, whether the xenobiotic has a known minimum inhibitory concentration or not. If it does not have the minimum inhibitory concentration, we can take the panel of the bacteria and look for the MIC value. If they have impact on the bacteria, then we can go into the animal model. And then if they show any impact, then we can go and do different kind of exposure, environmental exposure, occupational exposure, residual exposure, acute exposure, and developmental exposure. And then if there is changes in the diversity, then we can go ahead and do it and do the uh, metatranscriptomics or the functional profiling and also look if there is changes into specific bacteria then we can go and perform MIC value for that and also look for if those bacteria are involved into the metabolism of that xenobiotic. Um, and uh, if there are responses that, okay, there is no changes into the microbiome, then we compare these with the other toxicological endpoints. And similar uh, decision tree is also for the host microbe uh, interaction, but uh, host microbe xenobiotic interaction that I'm not showing here due to the time. So the open question arising from my presentation is, can microbial dysbiosis be added as an endpoint for the hazard or the preclinical safety assessment? Second, whether these models could be used as evaluation for the developmental toxicity. As you can see at early um, uh, developmental stage, we were able to see changes into the, mi into the microbiome. And also, if ex vivo translational model could be used to identify gender-based differences. Um, well, but a uh, lot of research has been done in this area, but there are several data gaps and the research need. First is, not only we have to study the um, bacterial diversity, but we have to do the functional profiling also. And also the role of the gastrointestinal tract in the bioavailability and the metabolism of the xenobiotic and we have to assess the residual level and the chronic exposure of the xenobiotics, and also long-term exposure for the, if we have studied the short exposure for the xenobiotic. Then if determine if there are strong correlates between the developmental toxicity and xenotoxicity and GI toxicity, and if changes in the intestinal homeostasis lead to the higher vulnerability to infection and other metabolic diseases. And finally, to discover animal model or the genetic variant for the susceptibility and resistance for the GI disease. And this research has contributed to the FDA strategic plan for advancing the regulatory science and innovation. Specifically, one of the aim that is the modernized toxicology to enhance the product safety. And second, like we have made recommendation to our agency to be to consider the additional endpoint in the safety assessment of the xenobiotic, which will supplement the traditional metabolism, PKPD, toxicity, and tissue residues deposition information using the tox um, that is generally used for the traditional toxicology risk assessment. And with this, I would like to acknowledge my research team and uh, the funding with the interagency agreement between FDA and NIH. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Sangeeta. Come have a seat. Thank we you. have questions. I guess I get to ask you one right now, and then we'll save the rest and uh, ask them on the panel. That was a wonderful slide you had at the end showing the gaps. I was going to ask you, by the way, if you're held at gunpoint and told to take arsenic either orally or intravenously, which would you choose? <laughs> None. <laughs> None? It seemed to me like intravenous was a little better, but. <laughs> Intravenously is usually like you know that it is as a treatment people are given uh, for one of the kind of cancer. All right. It was an existential question, you know. <laughs> important. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank, uh, sorry about that. Yeah. So mm, the question was whether I will choose whether intravenous or the oral. I said, no, none, I will not choose any. <laughs> so what we have seen here, only the short-term effect, like we have given animal one exposure and we have seen, okay, 24 hours and 48 hours later. And that's what my last slide in the data gap, gap was. We have to see always the long-term effect or washout effect that you, show, uh, you have uh, asked the question earlier. So based on that, we are conducting some studies and we will be able to say what could be the what could be done to reverse yeah, that okay right. yeah it was looking to me like intravenous was a little bit more hopeful but you know who knows um, the question that keeps on coming up and that was a, your uh, second to last slide that showed gaps yeah. in knowledge was very very helpful and we will come back to that because I think the other speakers also have some other uh, knowledge gaps they'd like to contribute but the question comes up sort of precedes that and it has to do with what is a healthy microbiome? What do we know about that? And I realize that uh, there's a lot of knowledge gaps there, but are there any statements, affirmative statements you can make about what is a healthy microbiome? Well, several studies have come up defining the healthy microbiome, taking from the human as well as from the mouse and rat. So they have come up with 37 different bacterial combinations that could be actually the healthy microbiome. But still, like if you see a diverse population go from different ethnic group and all, you cannot really say what is the healthy microbiome. So, so it is a very good question, but nobody has answered for that. Till now. So are you suggesting that we might never get to understanding actually what that is? Or is it is it something that's as individualized as our thumbprint? Or uh, will there at some point, do you think, be certain criteria that we uh, at least will be able to? So what uh, scientists are coming up with, maybe different kind of bacteria have different metabolic profiling. So they're coming back to the metabolic profiling Okay, whether, okay, this bacteria has short-chain fatty acid production, that may be good, uh, but the same, it is present in other person, but it may not have like either short-chain fatty acid or it may have. So basically metabolic profiling is the best answer that we can say right now. Okay, so like in many things in life, it doesn't matter who you are or what you look like, it's more what you do. That's Okay, exactly. that's very helpful, and that might be a way that we start to get there. Okay, so uh, let's go on to our next speaker, and then we'll Move have a forward. panel discussion. Well, it's our pleasure to introduce the last speaker, Maeva Lavoyer. She's an agronomist and a sport in data science. Uh, she's doing the PhD through a collaboration between University of Zurich and the European Commission Joint Research Center. She's interested in data analysis and modeling to address biological and ecological questions, in particular, the role of different pressures and exposures on the uh, fungal and bacterial communities of the soil. And she's also interested in relating her scientific findings with policy-related actions and the development of a legal framework for protecting uh, soil biodiversity. Maeva, the floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me loud yeah. and clear? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Hi. Then, thank you very much for this introduction. 
Uh, today, indeed, I will approach how some microbial communities and functions can be influenced by anthropogenic factors at the European scale by investigating the impacts of land use intensification, but also pesticide use on both bacterial and fungal communities and function. And as said, this is uh, uh, this work is done in the framework of a PhD uh, about some microbial diversity and ecosystem functioning assessment across Europe in a collaboration between the GRC, University of Zurich, and Agroscope Reconnaught, also in Zurich. To illustrate the subject, we used Lucas or survey data. Since 2009, following a decision of the European Parliament, a normalized survey across all member states has been put in place um, and regularly to conducted to gather information on land cover and land use every three years. Lucas stands for um, uh, land use cover area frame statistical survey. And as of 2018, the Lucas Soil Survey now includes additional analysis aiming to assess soil biodiversity across Europe using DNA methods. And for this, a thousand points were selected in analysis, uh, targeted several attributes, among which bacteria, archaea, fungi, and more globally, eukaryotes. Point selection was performed uh, using the 20,000 points of Lucas Soil Survey, so the initial one, as an initial sampling population. And such as an optimal configuration was found replicating a broad range of environmental variables. So some physical chemical properties, topography, climate, and then cover. And in total, at the end of the campaign, uh, 885 sites were sampled, ranging from the Mediterranean, Mediterranean region up to the boreal climatic region, and representing to date the largest soil biodiversity assessment done in Europe. And the data set I'm working on consists in 715 of these sampling points, belonging to three different land covers, cropland, grassland, and woodland, and including four biogeographical climatic regions. And in each site, bacterial and fungal communities were assessed thanks to DNA and beta barcoding. We, separate the, we separated the three land covers of interest, so cropland, grassland, and woodland, into six final vegetation cover types based on Lucas classification that uses current land cover system. Croplands were separated into permanent crops, for example, fruit trees or olive groves or vineyards, and non-permanent crop, for example, cereals and legumes. Grasslands were differentiated into intensive grassland when they correspond to an old agricultural land that has not been cultivated in 2018 or the years before, and into extensive grassland when referring to a land predominantly um, cultivated covered by communities of grassland and grass-like plants and forbs, so more natural grassland, let's say. And woodlands were separated into coniferous or broody forests. And with those vegetation covers, we ordered them uh, along a gradient of increasing land use intensification, from woodlands that we considered as less managed and less disturbed, to grassland and croplands that we considered as highly managed and most disturbed areas. And along this gradient, we compared several community metrics, for example, richness, uh, diversity, structure, and as a proxy for land use intensification impact on soil bacterial and fungal communities. Uh, in this project, we measured uh, several community characteristics that I will quickly define. So for each site, we looked at the alpha diversity of communities that focuses on what is happening within a site. And with the richness, we count the number of taxonomic entities that were identified thanks to the DNA methods used. And with the diversity, here using the Shannon index, we look at how diverse the organisms within the sites are, meaning the number of different organisms uh, that are taxonomically distant and present in the site. This last notion here is illustrated by the scheme at the bottom of the slide, where you can see that the site A corresponds to alpha equal four, as four different types of organisms are identified here. And we also look at the beta diversity that is comparing sites by pair in terms of community structure and search how many organisms are different between both sites or put differently, how many are unique to each site and not found in common. On the scheme, still, beta diversity between the two sites at the bottom, sites B and site C, is equal to five because none of the organisms found in site B were found in site C and conversely. Uh, back to this uh, gradient of uh, land use intensification, we investigated first the variation of bacterial and fungal richness across the different vegetation cover types. 
to which we associated a certain level of uh, land use intensification. And we showed that the land use intensification had a significant impact on both bacterial and fungal communities, as the bacterial richness and within diversity were the lowest in woodland, and significantly increased in grassland and cropland, similarly to fungal communities that were the most numerous and diverse also in grassland and cropland compared to woodland. We also investigated the impact of land use intensification on the beta diversity, meaning the difference in community composition between pairs of sites. And we also observed that the communities differentiated with the vegetation cover type they belong to. Especially the most distinct communities here for bacteria and fungi as well, were the ones found in both extreme of the land use gradient. So in cropland and woodland, so the less least uh, disturbed environment and up to the highly managed one. Here, as soil perturbation creates more niches and local conditions, microbes may better adapt and develop in croplands compared to woodlands that might represent a highly competitive environment with a reduced set of well-adapted species. So our results suggested that more um, entropic, more highly managed uh, habitats like croplands may also represent an important pool for biodiversity. Uh, distinct from taxa found in more natural lands. Okay. After that, we established potential functional groups within the communities, and in the same way, we analyzed how the proportion of bacterial chemotherotroph, nitrogen fixes, and pathogens varied among the vegetation cover types, and so along this gradient. And bacterial chemotherotrophs are bacteria involved in the carbon cycle, while the end fixing bacteria are involved in the nitrogen one. We found that bacterial chemotherotrophs were more abundant in croplands and intensively managed grasslands, and bacterial end fixes dominated in coniferous forests, but were also found in high proportion in non permanent crops. And this last observation suggested that anthropogenic activities may have selected, if not introduced, this type of bacterial functional groups, the end fixing bacteria through fertilizer or manure application occurring in those areas. We also found that bacterial pathogens predominated in intensified areas, particularly intensively managed grasslands, as well as in permanent crops, and could have been potentially introduced through agricultural practices as well, uh, for example, compost and manure application or water management. Regarding fungi, um, ectomycorrhizal symbionts that are known to be involved in symbiotic relationship with a broad diversity of uh, forest trees were preferentially found in woodlands, and abuscular mycorrhizal fungi predominated in more natural grasslands. So those findings come as a confirmation to previous studies conducted at smaller scale in the literature. And our result also showed here concerning the ectomycorrhizal symbionts that less disturbed environments as woodlands hosted higher proportion of beneficial function, functional groups in terms of fungal ones. Finally, more saprotrophic and plant pathogenic fungi were also found in those more intensified areas, especially fungal pathogens that may have been favored by a more intensive agricultural management um, that reduce plant species richness allowing fungal pathogens to flourish because they have more room to do so. Uh, and this joined the Provo and Al findings from last year. Our data also suggested that here, clearly, other than diversity in itself and the richness that we've seen just before, the functional aspect should be duly taken into account before concluding about biodiversity richness, especially in more um, highly managed areas. Because here, looking at soil microbial functional groups, uh, land use intensification occurring in croplands and grasslands may promote the presence of negative functions such as bacterial and fungal pathogenicity. As a few take home messages about the impact of land use intensification here on communities and functions, I would like to remind that here we showed that this land use intensification affected soil microbial diversity and function 
where we found a higher diversity that was detected in more uh, highly managed environments at the European scale. And that also changes in microbiome diversity were associated with uh, changes in functional groups as the, those croplands were um, the one hosting the, the highest proportions of chemoheterotrophic and pathogenic bacteria, as well as saprotrophic and pathogenic fungi. Finally, our data suggested that human action may also be the reason behind the inflation of taxonomical richness and diversity of soil microbial communities in those highly managed areas. And most importantly, that a higher taxonomic richness does not necessarily mean good, uh, as a higher richness here was associated to a larger presence of pathogens. So when assessing biodiversity, both taxonomy but also functional aspects should be taken together and considered. Sorry, okay. I will now approach a second part in our study, where I will work jointly with Julia Koeninger, another PhD student from my GRC team, and her supervisor, Maria Briones. Uh, the second part deals with the pesticide impacts on soil communities and function, and is still ongoing. So I will present some preliminary results before approaching the next steps and purpose perspectives of this project. So in this case, Lucas pesticide data consists in 256 sampling points across Europe that are being analyzed for biodiversity out of the 3,300 sites we uh, collected information about pesticide in. And the 256 sites uh, belong to three different vegetation cover types, so the same we've seen before, permanent and non-permanent crop and extensive grassland, meaning the more natural one again. And in the same way than previously seen, bacterial and fungal data were analyzed in those uh, sampling points. And 118 pesticide products were initially targeted. And at the moment, 149 salt samples still need to be analyzed in the lab, mainly belonging to woodland and intensive grassland. And by working jointly with Julia, we aim to establish how pesticide inputs can affect soil bacterial, fungal, but also eukaryotic communities at the larger scale at the European level. Uh, scale. The eukaryotic data are not part of today's presentation, but they will be integrated into analysis afterwards. First, an overview of the site characteristics. Uh, in nucleus classification, as mentioned, the vegetation covering the soil is classified based on coil and cover system, where we can assess a more precise information about the actual uh, um, vegetation that is present. And for statistical purposes, we had to group those smaller classes into broader ones. But here, for example, what is grouped under the non-permanent crops is mainly uh, common wheat to rum wheat, barley, maize, and sunflower, accounting for almost 70% of this type of crop. Looking at the number of pesticide products that uh, were detected in each vegetation cover type, we found that a higher number of pesticide products was detected in the non-permanent crop. And that still a few products were also found in more natural areas, extensively managed grasslands, meaning grasslands that were not former croplands before. Especially among the 118 uh, target, targeted pesticides initially, 76 products were detected in at least one site and 45 products were found in at least five sites here. And as you can see on the top of the bar plot, AMPA, which is a widespread degradation byproduct of glyphosate, was the product we encountered the most across all sites and in all types of vegetation cover, including the extensive grassland. Other products found with high occurrence were fungicides and herbicides like epoxiconazole, tebuconazole, poscalid, diphoflenican, and pedimetalin. Apart from a AMPA, which is um, a metabolite and boscalid, uh, most of the top products seen here um, are classified as group three, uh, meaning the most hazardous by the directive that is uh, here, establishing a harmonized risk indicator to estimate the trends in risk from pesticide use. And this group three is the main target of the farm to fork strategy. And those are the products we finally retrieve the most at the moment. We also retrieve few particularly concerning products as well, meaning the one that have already been banned or part of products non-approved by the directive. 
uh, like the linoleum that is a herbicide uh, used to control germinating and newly emerging weeds. And it was through its regulation history, it was identified as a possible human carcinogen and is now part of the non-approved products in terms of related risk, group four, and we still retrieve it uh, in the soil. Same for DDE and DDT. Uh, DDT being an insecticide widely used until the 60s, uh, and DDE being its um, degradation product, and still um, they are known to be persistent substances that can travel long distances through atmosphere, through water, are still widely found in the food, the environment, as well as in tissue of some living organisms. And here our finding confirmed that they are also still detected above the minimal threshold in soil as well. Finally, we also found a fungicide that was uh, identified as an endocrine disruptor and then carbendazine and terbutrine that is part of the pesticide that were also withdrawn from the EU. Back to the, the impact of pesticides on the communities here to identify how uh, pesticides impact those communities. We first focus on the 45 products that were present in at least five sites. And as some target products were byproducts from other ones, like the example of um, IMPA and glyphosate, we needed to limit the number of products included in the models testing for the, this pesticide impact to avoid collinearity in those models that would distort the result. That's why we had to feature selected the products that were the most impactful on communities. So focus on the most important one here. And that is why also here on the back-to-back -back bar plots, you can see only a reduced set of products that were found as highly relevant in explaining bacterial and fungal community richness. Here, as you can see, community richness was found to be highly shaped by MCPA concentration, which is an herbicide. And that was true for both bacteria and fungi. And also a high concentration of herbicide was found favoring microbial richness. But those results are to take with caution again, as we don't have yet the information on the related functions or the potential taxonomical group shifts that could occur. And we have seen before that a high richness, a promoted one, does not necessarily mean good. Also, fungal community richness was impacted by more products than the bacteria, and particularly, we found that some products were found um, affecting bacteria and not fungi, and conversely, and also that the same product could have a different effect either positive or negative on bacterial and fungal communities, depending on the, the domain we are looking at, so eukaryote, prokaryote. From the models obtained before, we can assess, uh, access a detailed output of each product effect on the communities. Here we can see that the, we have the 10 pesticide products that have the most important impact on the bacterial richness, so the one from the bar plot just before. And we can also observe that some, some of the relations that are uh, between bacterial uh, richness and each product are influenced by a few points in which the concentration of a given product is particularly high. So this, uh, this particular point will be better accounted for in further analysis. Regarding the diversity, we also found that bacterial community structure was mainly shaped by two fungicides concentration, uh, azoxystrobin and ciprodinin. Further investigation here are needed to really understand how bacterial community can be influenced by fungicide. Um, if it's a bacterial community shift that could be observed because there are changes in fungal communities or not. So yes, this will be also further investigated. As few take-home messages from those pre preliminary results, I would like to highlight several points here. Um, our results show that pesticides were more present in intensified soil areas, and that pesticide products can affect uh, both bacterial and fungal communities, but differently. Fungi were found to be sensitive to a higher diversity of products, and non-target effects were detected, detected too, as a herbicide, MCPA, uh, was found affecting soil microbes. Also, a pesticide product found promoting microbial richness cannot be considered as beneficial as such without having uh, a look at the impacts on microbial taxonomical group shifts or the functional aspects related to those communities. 
So at the moment, a lot remains to be explored. Uh, and here are the next steps and perspectives linked to this project. We will rerun the analysis once the information from the remaining sites to the 149 missing sites arrives. And we will tune the model so that the important proportion of flow concentrations are accounting for differently than the high concentration of products uh, that we have seen. The aim is also to determine which part of the previous result can be uniquely attributed to pesticide. Once we have accounting for uh, environmental variables like uh, soil properties, climate, vegetation. And as mentioned before, we also need to gain more, in more insight about the mechanisms that occur within the communities. Would it be be between the bacteria and fungal in terms of relationships that could be modified by pesticide presence or more investigation at the functional aspects or at the taxonomical uh, group levels. And we also aim to integrate more information linked to pesticide risk here, as um, the concentration of a product doesn't really necessarily reflect its harmfulness. And one of our goals is also to be able to propose indicator species, meaning species that indicate either the presence of a given pesticide in soil when the threshold of the concentration, when a threshold um, for the concentration is exceeded, or species that are related to a certain level of pesticide risk that has been reached too. And finally, all of this uh, analysis and consideration will be uh, applied to also to eukaryotic data more broadly. So there's a lot to do, but a nice, uh, nice perspectives to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any question now or afterwards, I'd be glad to answer to them. And here is my email uh, in case some of them came later. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meva. We have, uh, we have some great questions for you, but I think what we're going to do is invite up all our panelists right now and uh, start a conversation. And we will use you as the headliner because you didn't get your own QA time, but that way we can actually start uh, with a dialogue. And uh, to our audience, I, I'm working through these great questions. If you have questions that kind of synthesize things a little bit where we can bring in a conversation and the answers of different panelists, I would welcome that as well. Um, and where did they go? Oh, there's Mava. Where's, J oh, there you are. There's Jack, okay. The virtual world is very confusing to me. So uh, thank you to all of you. This was really uh, fantastic. And I think if you were listening, you heard a lot of intersections, right? Uh, um, we, Martin was talking about glyphosate. It was in mice. Uh, Meva was talking about glyphosate in soil, uh, but actually the AMPA, which is a, a, a byproduct of that, uh, we heard about um, the fungi, the uh, mycorrhizal fungi, and how they're affected by certain um, agricultural styles and also f uh, fungicides in the soil. And Jack had uh, spoken to us earlier about how these are actually considered therapeutics in certain situations uh, for unhealthy soil. So as you can see, uh, we're starting to get themes and we're also starting to get the same answers in different scales and different ecosystems. And that for me is uh, when the science starts to get interesting. But um, what I would like to focus on here, and, and, and I actually, I, I, I think I might be saying the obvious here, but um, before our session, uh, I don't know if any of you were in the previous session, but it was five governmental experts who were up here. And one of the things that they were trying to tackle is how do we start to study these questions from a one health approach? Uh, and kind of moving from one to one, to capital one. One is what you were traditionally doing of kind of looking at uh, one tissue, one xenobiotic or one insult. Now we're looking at big one, O-N-E, of looking not just at humans and animals, but also different environments and the interactions between all of these. Um, and I would like to propose that studying the microbiome should be a headline activity in taking on this one health approach because the microbiome truly does flow literally between us and other species and other environments. Uh, according to Jack, I, 
I've got like 60 million uh, microbes that have come off me onto this chair since I've been uh, sitting here. Um, but um, it also, if you think of all the big issues that we're tackling right now, climate change, antibiotic resistance, uh, uh, chronic disease in human health, uh, environmental degradation, they all have to do with the microbiome. And so uh, using this really as a marquee issue will drive a lot of these One Health questions and a, 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 a truly integrated, holistic approach to risk assessment. Um, that's just my little uh, soapbox for a second. So in the US, maybe they have that here too. We have something called fantasy football where you get to make up your own football team. You can pick people from all, and you know, our football is different, but uh, you can pick people from all these different leagues and put them together and make your dream team kind of. Well, I wanna have uh, fantasy microbiome research going on right now, and the five of you are my dream team, okay? And I would like to ask you, based on what you've heard from each other, because I know you've all been paying rapt attention to these amazing presentations, what is a study that you would propose to address some of the gaps we talked about today that would involve at least one other person on this team, and hopefully two or three or maybe even five. And Meva, I hope it's okay. I'm gonna start with you because you are from a totally other ecosystem, so I'm sure you've been hearing things that are blowing your mind here. So tell us what you think. I hope you can hear me again. Um, yeah, so from the presentation I've seen, uh, I can clearly see also all the, I was talking about the functional aspect and I think that uh, going for more metagenomics in what we're doing, for example, in Lucas and, and similar studies is really needed, like uh, trying to understand how it works at the functional genes level. Uh, that's also what uh, what I was thinking uh, along the, the presentation. Um, and also, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken here, um, there are some background in ecotoxicology, and I think that's also something that would be worth to integrate into the risk assessments of the pesticide for soil life. Because as mentioned, for now, we have, for example, concentrations of products, but it doesn't mean that one product that is in low concentration is less harmful than another one that would be in higher concentration. So this risk impact is also really missing here. And I think we would gain in combining how, uh, yes, how the, this risk associated to each product is finally um, impacting soil communities. Great, thank you. And just as a follow-up question, I, I had asked Sangeeta what is a healthy human microbiome. Is there a little bit more understanding of that when it comes to agriculture? In terms of a soil so. microbiome, <laughs> Jack is shaking his head. No, no, no. <laughs> it's the same. We don't know where the baselines are. In old but also mm -hmm. maybe focusing yes. a little bit more on functional things, so the metabolome moving away from just describing what you're seeing and more what they're doing. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and there are many different players that can do the same thing. Is that, yeah, that's what it sort of seemed like from your slide. Jack, I'm going to go I think, on. I yeah. think the, the uh, just in addition to that, I think the difficulty is we can't define health. We're very good at defining disease. We're very good at defining crop disease, human disease, animal disease. Uh, we, know, we know what a, a damaged soil is, right? We know that it, it doesn't produce the things we want it to produce. <clears throat> um, we know it's not good at acquiring carbon. Uh, we're not very good at saying what's, what's healthy. And, and you, you pointed this out, it's diversity, right? You know, what's healthy for you is differently healthy for me. And in the context of your previous question, you know, we just launched a $175 million program for the NIH um, trying to examine how people respond to different diets, right? And so that's, uh, that's nine centers across um, uh, uh, 15 labs in, in the US. Uh, I, I want to see the same thing for the ecotox world, right? I want to see a combined and targeted um, funding program that brings together as many people as possible to do kind of what Mabel just pointed out, right? right? That's, a, that's a phenomenally large study 
of soils to identify associations between the uh, the b bacterial fungal communities and and the different pollutants right we could do the same thing for humans we just need the scale you know in our nutrition for precision health program uh, that's 175 million dollars to cover 12,000 13,000 people um, we need similar kinds of large scale investment structures to get you know tens of thousands of people enrolled so we can understand how different pollutants in the different food streams affect people differently. And that will uh, account for all of the variability in the numbers that we need. We need statistical power. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's come back to that because I'm curious to hear in the EU if there are any efforts related to that. But any other uh, dream team ideas going on here can be in a totally, uh, you know, pursuing a different line of thought. I'm, I can, uh, see that you're thinking there, Benoit. What, you, what do you got for us? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a real dream team I can think of, but I can definitely think that, see that the things are changing and that it's getting more and more collaborative and people are working more and more together. What's fascinating with the microbiome field is when it started, um, I would say 20, 25 years ago, the, the study were really coming from one specific lab at the time and it was really not very in-depth, very observational. And now we are able to combine metagenomic, metabolomic, uh, genetics data from clinical, from soil, combining all of that with the food aspects. I mean, uh, and all of that only in 20, 25 years. So yeah, things are changing a lot and, and people are working more and more together. And I think the microbiota, taking into account the microbiota allows us to merge a lot of fields together and, and to collaborate with people we were not working with before. And, and I think it's getting more and more popular to have this very big consortium. So did you hear anything today that might make you think differently or try something new? Um, <coughs> yeah, I think, I, I think regarding the, the communication between the various organ and how microbiota from one organ can go to another organ, I know that there is a lot of people that are having some interest about that. And, and I think hearing about how the FDA is approaching the, this risk assessment and, and yeah, I, I think looking at how the different microbiota are communicating with each other. I think it can be something really, really interesting. I think it's going to be the, maybe the next next challenge to okay. understand to understand yeah, better the microbiota. A fascinating model and so helpful. Martin, what did you come up with? Yeah, so maybe I Thank can you. add a bit to that. I think uh, one of the interesting perspectives is to, to to bring together the different fields of microbiota research. So, so of course, I'm in the in the gut microbiota as as, as others here, but but the soil microbiota and the and the knowledge within that field. It's interesting, for instance, that Maeve, that you're, you're explaining that you actually see an increase in diversity. And normally in, in, in the gut microbiota, we are, we're thinking of, of increased diversity as being good. Uh, but is that so for, for, for all different systems? Uh, and I think there's a lot to learn from, from each other and, and also the most traditional ecosystem thinking uh, when, when working within the microbiota field. And then I think Benoit would be, uh, I mean, you're, you have some excellent capabilities for, for imaging. Uh, so maybe bringing that into the, into the soil, I'm not sure whether that's the, that's the plan, but, but that could be really nice to see some, some pictures of the rhizosphere and, and, uh, and what that actually looks like when you start uh, doing confocal, uh, confocal imaging. Those are wonderful examples, Sangeeta. So, yeah, I would like to build on what I already talked about, the risk assessment. So we have an FDA, like, we are thinking about that. EU, I haven't heard much about that, to, like, what could be the endpoints for the risk assessment. And want to also include the academic institutes, basically. So some research, I think government agencies can do that, okay, risk assessment, define the guidelines and all. But then there is something like, okay, susceptibility after we have xenobiotic interaction with the host, the microbiome is disturbed, whether that really increases the susceptibility to infection or more prone to the other xenobiotic exposure adverse effect. And I think for that, there should be also collaboration with the academic institutes and all who can look into that kind of aspect. Terrific. There are a lot of questions coming up about therapeutics, uh, both uh, in our, for our gut, for our soil, and uh, so on, which I think is so interesting because 
So we don't have enough information somehow to propose public health measures or regulation, but we seem to have enough information to sell a lot of therapeutics and produce them. Um, but, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm a little confused about that, but uh, um, with the soil, uh, what you were seeing, uh, May the, um, uh, was it all chemical pesticides and herbicides that were problematic? Or were you actually seeing some that were, I guess, more natural <laughs> kind of um, uh, bio pesticides that were being used? And were um, they problematic? So for now, uh, out of the 45 products I was mentioning, we have insecticides, uh, herbicides, and pesticides. Uh, but we do like, at the moment, the, the information on what is happening at a more precise scale. So talking about the impact of a project on communities, even just considering soil communities, we have seen that there are, for the same products, very different uh, impacts on bacteria and fungi separately. So I think the difficulty here in assessing the effect of one product is the type of organisms we are considering. Because I could not totally answer your question if I'm focusing on bacteria or rather on fungi or maybe at the taxonomical level group, maybe a genus will be um, will be impacted differently among the same. Uh, right. Same but it part. wasn't so studied specifically at what was referred to as sort of microbial uh, pesticides that are used. That was not something that you looked at. Um, so actually, uh, there is a practice in agriculture of using microbial formulations to control certain populations. Mm -hmm. And that was not looked at at all no. as a factor. Okay. No, no. Uh, uh, among the, the three type of uh, uh, um, products we have, no, we didn't have this. Okay, let's see here. Uh, um, moving on. Are woodlands undergoing forestry practices? Oops, I just lost that question mid. Uh, it disappeared. Uh, you want to go back? OK, we'll move on to another one, then I'll go back. Um, so uh, I, there's, I, I think we're going to move back to the risk assessment project that we have at hand here, because there's a number of questions related to that. And I did ask this question of Jack already, and I think a little bit of Sangeeta. But is there any other folks here who are willing to put their flag in the soil, so to speak, uh, regarding causality, and actually suggest to folks who are doing risk assessment uh, that there's actually something that we can assess a risk of and potentially propose a regulation for? Does anybody want to take a stab at that? So I, I would give you a case study in okay. which one of the uh, drug was withdrawn like uh, by FDA. So this is a drug that is used. It is arsenic based drug. It is used into the chicken uh, for as antibacterial. It is based on the arsenic roxazone name is the roxazone. So it was given to chicken to have a more plum flush and uh, uh, they were like, because they are grown in compact environments, so they were working as antibacterial. But what was seen when, okay, when they poop actually, so that poop was used into the rice field. And that rice field had more contamination of the ox, uh, arsenic. So what was found that this roxazone was converted into the gut of the chicken into more toxic species and it is going into the rice field. So then this drug was actually withdrawn from the market. So, okay. So that is one of the, like how it is impacting rice, chicken, soil, like everything is getting connected. Like uh, That's a terrific example. It is notably of a chemical which is ar already highly regulated, but it seems right. like it took it to a new level and actually withdrew it from the market. But how about new products that at this point are, that you folks are not even thinking about, like I don't think anybody's regulating carboxymethylcellulose right now. Is anybody involved regulating carboxymethylcellulose? No. Or any of the other food emulsifiers. Are you willing to take a stand there, Benoit? Jack's shaking his head behind you. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I think most, most... You have an unfair advantage. You can't do that. <laughs> most of the, the additives that, are, that were approved to be used, they were approved to be used based on very simple toxicity tests, and, and the macrobiota was not even part of the equation at the time. So now that we know all of that the macrobiota is definitively a, a key direct target of, the, of, those, of some of those compounds, and putting back the macrobiota back into the equation, I think we'll be able to test a lot of causality link in, 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 in this risk assessment. And there is also a, a lot of new models that are currently being developed. I mean, germ-free mice is very useful to test the causality. Uh, in vitro microbiota system also, we are able to reproduce to a very, very good extent the human microbiota in, in a tube. So we can test a lot of things. We can test the dysbiotics, uh, the ability of, of select compounds to induce dysbiosis, to increase pro-inflammatory potential. And, and, and this is without any host component and, and just testing the direct interaction between the macrobiota and the food additive. So, yeah, I, I think definitively macrobiota by just putting back the macrobiota back into the equation will be able to investigate most of the, a lot of the causality interaction between food additives and, and, and detrimental impact on health. So you feel this is right around the corner? I, I definitely feel this is right around the corner. I have no idea about the, I, I have no idea about the, the timeline of that. But yeah, no, definitely at, at some point, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to use the macrobiota data to define, maybe not for the general population, but just thinking about IBD patients. And what we are currently doing a, a big trial on, on IBD patients, and, and for sure, uh, some of the people that are going to withdraw dietary misifiers will benefit from it. Some of the people, I'm pretty sure, will not benefit from it. In the future, will, will we be able to use microbiota data to say to specific IBD patient, okay, you are highly susceptible to this type of food additive you should avoid. You, you are protected against the detrimental impact of those food additives, so just keep going and, and keep eating those food additives, you, you, you are safe. I, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do that. I have okay. no idea about the, the timeline, but this is something we are actively working on, and, and yeah, I'm an Terrific. optimistic guy, and, and I'm sure we will be able to do that. Jack, I see you uh, wanting to add something in there, yeah. but I just want to uh, quickly jump to Mavic going to the other end of the field there, literally. Uh, anything, any place you're willing to stick your flag in terms of, at this point, in terms of the studies that you've done so far of things that, you know, before you weren't thinking of, but now really do need to be monitored, uh, policies need to be developed and they need to be regulated either in terms of uh, cropping systems or actual uh, chemical products? Uh, I think concerning the, the risk assessment and this part of the question, I think uh, I've addressed it a little bit earlier, the fact that we do need to understand more the risk of the pesticide products on the soil biota because still the studies are existing, but at smaller scale or a controlled environment for certain. So I think at a large scale, being able to pinpoint some areas in which um, the uh, application of a product is particularly concerning for either the functional aspect or the richness and so on is something that we are still missing. But for the policy part of your question, I think one important point to underline here is that soil biodiversity regarding policy is um, has been quite left behind for some time because no policy is currently addressing it as such. But I think now we've seen in the policy field that there are some nice initiatives that are taken at the EU level at the moment. Uh, the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030 or the farm to fork strategy that I was mentioning or the EU soil strategy with the soil um, health law. So all those um, this policy framework is slowly uh, accounting for soil biodiversity as a, a natural resource, um, an important one. But I think for now, the, the first step are to integrate uh, soil biodiversity in a full policy framework that directly tackle, tackle them and not indirectly by water pollution and so on. I think we're still missing this first step, but we are working on it. And this week, there were some uh, nice um, news like uh, the, the pesticide reduction by 50 percent that is uh, is still a proposal on the table and uh, the alt also to biodiversity loss in europe with legally binding uh, eu targets so i think now we are approaching uh, a first step for soil biodiversity and then we will see how to <laughs> how to develop that but, uh. thank you and jack 
You had something you yes. wanted to add to what Benoit has said. Well, to, to uh, this whole conversation, really. Yeah. Remember, there's only one FDA approved for the United States, FDA approved microbiome therapy. Uh, that's fecal microbiome transplant to treat recurrent C. difficile. There are no other microbiome therapies that are FDA approved. There's a whole suite of potential probiotics, but they have to be generally recognized as safe. They have to be uh, food-based products uh, that have been consumed regularly for a long period of time. For agricultural use, there are all experimental licenses. There's nothing that's been approved on a national scale that I'm aware of uh, other than um, uh, you know, generally recognized as safe organisms being added into rootstocks. I mean, we're not talking about, um, there's nothing out there really, you know. Um, it took 30 years, 30 or 40 years uh, from when we first identified that lead might be damaging in petrol to get any policy at all that looked towards banning leaded petrol, leaded gas, right? So that's, it takes a very, very long time to move the machine towards a situation where it can actually be monitored. And right now, for soil health, uh, one of our best metrics is probably glomulin, right? A, a protein produced by uh, fungi in soil um, as a metric for saying, is the soil healthy, right? Or is it not healthy? How much glomulin does it have? Does it have a lot of glomulin? That's great. Does it not have a lot of glomulin? That's not great, right? The biodiversity component is incredibly valuable, but the tools that we're using our proportional data, they're not, they're not quantitative necessarily, we're working on that. They, are, they, they don't create these metrics which we can use effectively to drive policy decisions. And those, that, that's more, we, we, we're doing research. We're mm -hmm. not trying to drive policy and, and it's gonna take a while for us to get there. I, I hear you um, and uh, uh, on the other side of things, we know that this is central to soil degradation and an explosion in chronic disease that we're seeing. Uh, and well, particularly well, no, 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 no. inflammatory, we don't, we don't know that. well, there is an we association. There is absolutely there's an association. A, there's a, there's a, there's yeah, a, there's an association between a lot of things. Yeah, right? I just uh, don't we, know we if we have 30 or 40 drive. years here. Um, so we might, I, we might not do, but that's yeah. human nature, right? We're yeah, destined to kill ourselves for sure. Um, but uh, that being said, I do appreciate what you're saying, and we have a bunch of questions about science, so we'll get back to those. For example, someone asked. Why are the animal models not sufficient here? I mean, given that uh, uh, we're actually, um, I, I, the question went away there. Uh, why would current animal safety oral toxicity studies, including chronic studies, which inherently expose gut microbes, be insufficient? And I actually think that's a really good question. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. I, I think it's it's mostly based on the, on the length of the study. I mean, when you are focusing on microbiota, and especially the impact of the microbiota on the host in terms of chronic inflammatory diseases and metabolic deregulation, obesity, type two diabetes, to see the effect is going is going to take a very very long time. And and when there is risk assessment for a specific compound, it's it it never go to that point where you can see the chronic effect on the intestinal microbiota. For this, uh, scientists and, and and research are doing a lot of things. But yeah, microbiota is, is taking a long, long time to have a detrimental consequence for the host, and, and especially when talking about inflammation. Got it, okay. Uh, all right, we've got a couple more asking the same question again. I can ask it again, and maybe we get a different answer. You know, is that the sign of insanity where you ask the same question <laughs> multiple times, uh, hoping for a different answer? But, uh, you know, can we, uh, uh, is there enough sound?